Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Um, and as of today, uh, if you're watching this live, this is American Thanksgiving. So if you are American, if you celebrate it, then happy Thanksgiving. Personally, I am thankful uh, today, particularly for my moderators who uh, do amazing work here on this channel. Uh, so thank you, uh, Chrissy. Thank you, Clark and Tacos. Uh, and thank you, Andrew, as well. You do amazing amazing work uh, each and every week and I just wanted to say a particular thanks to you today. Today, as it's probably going to be a little bit uh, quieter than usual because of Thanksgiving, uh, then what I will do is just have an open q and I've got as I always do, a whole load of questions from my patrons. Uh, I always try and frame my live streams around questions from my patrons, but I'll hopefully, hopefully be able to pick up as many questions as I can from the chat as we go through. So these questions could go anywhere. So not so much a theme today as just sort of picking up random things as we go on. So um, I did have a super chat just before we went live from Captain Anopheles saying, do you think it's possible that the making of Azora High's sword was a metaphor for the creation of the first dragon or did dragons predate the long night? Um, well, on the second point in terms of dating, we don't know is the short answer. We haven't got that. George R. Martin is very clear that we shouldn't be exact about timings, about details of uh, things back in the Age of Heroes and the Dawn Age and things that were a long time ago. He has said that there was a time when dragons were over the entire planet, yes, over Westeros as well as Essos. The implication was that that was before uh, the uh, Valyrian uh, freehold, but we don't know the exact time scale going on there. Now, is this um, a metaphor? So, is the Azura High myth a metaphor for the creation of the first dragon? Well, the first thing I have to say, as I always say about this, is this is a very strange bit of the story to have actually come handed down because you would have expected that the bit of the story about Azora High which would have been handed down was how Azora High won the day, how Azora High pushed back the long night, ended it, defeated the others, something like that. We don't get that at all, we just get this bit of a story about the creation of Lightbringer, which is intriguing because that then implies that that is the important point that people wanted us to take away from this rather than the exactly how the others were defeated. Is this just some sort of uh, allegory or ancient memory of how dragons were created? Well, there certainly is a lot of matching symbolism going on. There's certainly fire and blood involved, and certainly in terms of the dragons, um, then this all dragony magic is fire and blood so clearly there's something going on there clearly having the fiery sword is uh very much a kind of symbol of dragons as well i've read various theories about how symbolically the dragons could be light bringer in this this new azura high reborn kind of world so yes that's entirely possible personally um I, I suspect that that is not about the creation of the dragons, if indeed dragons were created. Septon Bath seems to think perhaps they were, but um, I think it is just a snapshot of a bit of a story that we get from way back to do with the Long Night. So I think it it is roughly at a high level what we're told it is rather than actually secretly something else. But there are definite echoes there that are going on. So I think that's a really good spot. Uh, AK Channel TV, thank you so much, saying, what do you think about Jamie's line in season eight, episode five, saying, to be honest, I never really cared much for them, innocent or otherwise. Oh, this is, uh, so this is Game of Thrones season eight. Uh, when Jamie's talking about the people of King's Landing, uh, I did not like that line one little bit. I don't think that will surprise many people. Um, 
the whole point of Jamie's character was that the fundamental, one of the fundamental moments for him was when he killed the Mad King because the Mad King was about to kill the people of King's Landing. And so for him to suddenly turn around and say, I never really cared about them, that is not Jamie. That's not his character. So I don't think that line for me worked very well at all. It struck me as a sort of a shortcut that the showrunners used in to try and justify Jamie's actions because they didn't do the the longer build-up, which would have made some of his actions make a lot more sense. So I didn't like it, is the, is the answer. I, I suspect most people didn't like it. Um, it was one of, the, one of the bits about season eight that I least liked, was where they took Jamie's character on that. Um, let's take some questions from my patrons. Um, as I say, these are going to be dotting about all over the place. Let's start with one from Howland's little sister saying, congratulations on launching your website. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, I did that last week. If you're interested, my new home base, as it were, is indeepgeek.com. So please do go and check that out. That's also the place to go if you're interested in any merch um, and also audiobooks. I do uh, narrate audiobooks as well with my second channel, The Well Told Tale, and I've stitched a few of them together and I've put them up there if you're interested in that as well. So do go and check out indeepgeek.com. But thank you very much. Do you have any thoughts or comments about Melisandre's feelings about dragons, since they obviously are fire-related creatures and she uses fire a lot with her role as a red priestess? Yeah, so I think... I think she's going to be pro-dragons. I think that she is... Um, one of the things that she is very clear on is this idea of uh, stone dragons being made flesh. Now, that was part of the reason, I suspect, uh, why she went to Dragonstone, because there are lots of stone dragons there. Now, obviously, none of them ever became real dragons, so she's probably right now in herself wondering where where that might come true, how this might actually happen. So um, I think that that's probably at the back of her mind is this trying to work out what's going on. And the um, the existence of Danny and the dragons will probably cause her to pause for a moment and have a think about it because although she is very single-minded and I don't think there's any chance that she's going to come across to Team Danny at any point, um, I think that the stone dragon eggs that became actual dragons is probably the biggest or most convincing of the arguments around what does that bit of prophecy mean. So I think Melisandre's thinking is going to be quite confused on this. She will want the dragons on her side. Absolutely. She loves fire and fire magic and all the rest of it. She will probably, once she gets over the Stannis thing, and I think she will switch her support to John. All the hints are there about, you know, I, I seek for Azor High and all I see is snow and things like that. I think that she will latch on to Jon Snow after Stannis has gone, and I think Stannis will die at some point relatively soon. I think that Jon getting a dragon will for her be the sort of the culmination. So I think that is where we're going. She is going to be obsessed with dragons when she realizes that they're actually on the table and could possibly a part, be a part of this. Um, Robinson just picking up in the chat saying, I wonder if we'll see another John point of view chapter. Robert assumed, I assumed that, that so in the video, in my video on the pages for the winds of winter, but I'd like to know why people assume we get another POV from him. Um, I'd be interested in other people's views in that, uh, it's just picked up on it, but, um, I, I see no reason why we shouldn't get any more John POV chapters. The the fact that he has died and will then come back, I don't think that should interrupt the POV narratives coming from him. Personally, um, of, I think it's clear that George R. R. Martin has not said 
that whenever he's done lots of updates he's done about the winds of winter um and which characters he's going back to he's never said i'm now doing a john chapter that's probably because from his perspective he killed john off at the end of the last chapter and he at the end of the last book and he wants people to be um not a hundred percent sure about what's going to happen there so i think that that's what's going on it's the equivalent of when kit harrington had to go do the media rounds before season seven or six or whatever it was uh, and pretend that he was dead uh, when he knew full well that he was going to be coming back and uh, a big part of the next season so um, that i think is what explains that but i would love to hear other people's thoughts on um why we might not get a uh, new john uh, chapters rosa monk thank you so much saying why did beric decide to give his life essence to raise lady stoneheart did he know something we readers don't know was it a command from the law i think that it's i mean this is a fascinating thing and i will have to go back and i'll be honest and have a look and analyze it to come to a stronger view because i suspect there probably is a um uh, a better answer than this one but um i think fundamentally he he'd lost his passion and this was something which had happened he'd been brought back so many times he'd he'd almost now forgotten the point of why he was there and what he saw was an opportunity to pass on to somebody else this mantle now what we have to remember is that he started out the re whole reason he went out in the first place with what became the brotherhood without banners was on a command from ned stark so actually for him this seems to come round full circle uh, sort of in a kind of a, a an arc a sort of a not, not a character arc but a perhaps a plot arc around to the fact that suddenly he thinks ah you know what i was sent here by ned stark now i can help ned stark by bringing back his um wife now he probably doesn't think to himself oh you know what in fact he doesn't know that she's going to be like lady stoneheart he probably thinks that she's going to be a bit like he was when he came back the first time yes he lost a a few memories and all the rest of it it was only the repeated coming back that seemed to do it for him so from his perspective he probably is completely unaware of the fact that he's going to create this um rather vindictive character in and vengeful character in lady stoneheart he probably thinks he's create he's going to be bringing back somebody who is more like ned stark wife uh, that he will be aware of so um well, I think we need to get away from this idea of that he knew what Lady Stoneheart was going to be like. He did not know. He thought that he was just doing his duty. There may be other reasons. Maybe he feels that uh, he felt something for the law, but I don't think it was that. I Personally, at the moment, my best guess is that he was just tired. Uh, Gus Mulder, thank you so much, saying happy Turkey Day. Uh, Mary Mazder was trained by Marwin the Mage, who was from a shy but is now in Westeros. Did he plant Mary Mazder to kill Carl Drogo or to help Danny hatch dragons or both? Um, right, I think the short answer here is no. I think in unless marwin has some huge epic backstory that we're completely unaware of i think the short answer is no the um the fact he did not come from a shy he yes he went there he, he's been he traveled around searching for magical mysteries and all the rest of it and training um and she did indeed it would uh, appear train um, alongside actually quite a few of these kind of magical characters she seems to have come into contact with. I do not personally think that Marwyn the Mage is is manipulating events from behind the scenes. He has a or had a glass candle, but as far as we're aware, they were not working until after Daenerys's dragons were hatched and a there's no clear 
implication that anybody thought that was about to happen. So I, I'm more given to the idea that this was coincidence than anything else. So not a, an epic plot to um, uh, to kill Karl Drogo or anything like that. I think that it's just a big world. And, and we often, I think, try and... Um, I don't know how to exactly put it, but by trying to tie things together, sometimes we make the world a lot smaller than it actually is. This is a world of millions of people. And yes, sometimes lives will cross, but not everybody has got a master plan that is tying everything in together. Um, question from... AK Channel TV, thank you again, uh, saying uh, part one, I can accept the argument that Danny is mad, but only if there is acknowledgement that Arya and Sansa are mad too. I, I mean, I don't know whether this is directed at me in particular. I don't uh, subscribe to the idea that Danny is or will be mad per se. I think, firstly, that is a gross generalizing word that is just not helpful. Secondly, I think that Georgia R. R. Martin has shown that she's got different parts of her character. That is the the point of the Marine uh, uh, segment of her story, is to show two parts of her character fighting one another for control. And the fact that she will shift from the wanting to be the peace-loving monarch and conciliator towards being more fire and blood Targaryen type does not mean that that other part has disappeared she has many layers to her character so I don't think that makes her mad I think also if you saw my recent video on Danny, I also have this kind of take that I built on other people's ideas that the Targaryens and Valyrians probably are part dragon and so actually their love of fire is not, it's not a madness. It's not a, anything vindictive in any way. This is actually just natural for them. This is what dragons do. Dragons burn things. And so that is part of her character and who she is. So I personally do not subscribe to this idea that Danny is or will be mad in some way. I don't think that that's where George R. R. Martin is going with this character at all. Um, and then part two, thank you very much, uh, saying they are very similar in acts of cruelty. Sansa feeds Ramsay to dogs and smiles. Arya kills a whole family. We don't know if some of them may not have wanted to participate. Yeah, so these are both show things. Now, um, Sansa feeding Ramsay to the dogs is... Uh, now, that on the show was because she was getting revenge or justice for what Ramsay did to her. So that is in understandable, whether we think that that is the right thing to do, but it, we can understand the personal motivations on that one. I uh, killing all of the phrase uh, on the show, this hasn't happened in the books, I personally think that she won't be the person to do that in the books. I think that it will probably be Lady Stoneheart, possibly with Nymeria in the super pack. Uh, but there, I think that there's a whole Riverlands plot that's going to be happening in the Winds of Winter that is uh, initially at least going to not be including Aya. I think that they just wanted Aya to do a, a big assassination so that we could see that she was escalating on the show i would agree absolutely she that they tried to say that this was her getting personal revenge on every single person who was involved in this and it clearly clearly she could not have double checked with every single person in that hall to see whether or not they were involved with it whether they were um in any way sympathetic to it so yes that one uh, certainly takes Aya to another level above and beyond what she currently is in the books. It'll be interesting to see whether the books take her further in that uh, route as well. Um, oh, did I miss one? Uh, Kraken Tacos, thank you very much. Saying AK Channel uh, TV, who is a better commander, Tywin or Stannis? Ooh. 
good question. I think the Tywin certainly seems to be a better peacetime manager of um, the realm. He seems to be a very effective Hand of the King, whether you consider him to be a good Hand of the King is a different matter, I guess, but he certainly seemed to be a very effective manager of the realm. Stannis seems to be more um, deliberate, and if you say commander, being a sort of a commander of um, the uh, an uh, army. Now, he, as a youngster, held out in Storm's End for a while. That actually did require a reasonable amount of leadership. He was a effectively a child at the time, and, and he did do that. Then he did claim Dragonstone. That was quite an easy-ish victory. He did claim the victory up at the wall. Um, he lost the Battle of the Blackwater. He's not got a 100% record, to be honest. So I think that with Stannis, I'm holding, holding back on my judgment on his abilities as a military commander until I see what's going on with Winterfell, because I think that is the big the big um challenge that he's got at outside winterfell so far he's losing a lot of troops in the winter cold he's camped a little bit away from winterfell and, and doesn't appear to be moving towards it he has to have a plan there does seem to be a plan he is starting to develop but we haven't seen it yet so that is really going to be the the judgment call on it tywin is very they're very similar in the fact that they are both very directional and they both make decisions and stick to them which is obviously a very good thing tywin however seems to be a lot more strategic in the way that he's doing this he holds back and then he strikes and when he strikes he makes sure that he strikes powerfully and effectively at that particular moment in time he won the battle of the blackwater by bringing um uh, his forces to arrive at just the right time. Uh, and he claimed the Westerlands in a way that his father definitely couldn't. He, in the Roberts Rebellion, he was the one who ensured that King's Landing fell and he made sure that he timed his arrival at just the right moment so he could pick the winning team. So out of the two of them, Tywin is the greater strategist at the moment, but we'll, we'll wait and see what Stance has got uh, coming up. Uh, Mara Lee, thank you so much for the the super sticker. Uh, that's very uh, kind. Uh, I do appreciate that. I've got some questions from you. I've got coming up. Uh, so thank you so much. And also, I, you did uh, you did a super sticker and a super chat before we went live. I was going to read them when I got to your questions. So thank you for for this one. Um, <laughs> Crack and Tacos saying that Stannis is the one true king. It is known. Th that is your your view. You are very welcome to it. Max Pokies, uh, thank you so much, saying, what's the Grand Northern Conspiracy? Read it multiple times, but have no clue what it means. Well, I'll give you the high-level um, bit, which is that whereas the Boltons have control of Winterfell and are... Well, the, the Lannisters have basically said, you're now Wardens of the North and all the rest of it, not all of the North have signed up to this. They're pretending to. The key family in this are the Mandalays. Now, there are others. The Glovers are a part of this as well. You can um, uh, pick on a few other random houses that uh, are supportive. Some houses are like the Umbers, the, the Karstarks, a lot more complicated situation going on. But... The key thing is with the Mandalays. The Mandalays are the richest um, and most powerful family in the north. Starks accepted, but Starks obviously scattered. And they have decided that, you know what, we're not going to accept having the Boltons in Winterfell. So Wyman Mandalay has decided I'm going to put, he's heard this rumour that Rickon Stark is still alive on Skagos, and he's decided he's going to put him into Winterfell. But until then, he has to play along. And so what he is doing is he is playing along with the Boltons. And so he has gone up with some of his force, and they're in Winterfell, and he's been playing nice and all, 
all the rest of it. And that is what the Northern Conspiracy is. Is this idea that there are some Northern houses, including some big and powerful ones, who are pretending to be supportive of the Boltons, but secretly they are working to get the Starks back into power. And the main way that they are planning on doing this is by getting Rick on and then bringing him up to Winterfell uh, and taking Winterfell from within. So that's what's going on there. There are also a huge, they're, they're linking up with Stannis. Stannis has got his army just a little way outside uh, Winterfell. And basically the deal that Wyman Manderley is coming up with via Davos is that he will accept Stannis as the king as long as Stannis then allows Rickon to come back and be the Lord Stark and be in charge of Winterfell. So that's what they're doing. There's a lot of other houses just sort of doing a whole variety of other different things and a lot of characters who've got their own agendas like Barbary Dustin and people like that. But that is what the Grand Northern Conspiracy is. There's a lot of work happening in the background to try and get the Starks back into power. Um, um, do, do, do. Uh, Barrel Raider saying, tell us your top three Silmarillion moments. Love your channel. Uh, thank you so much. Well, this is mainly, this isn't a Song of Ice and Fire thing, so I'll just very quickly rattle off a few that I've, I've also been listening. I always, I seem to say this all the time. I'm listening through various things I've read before, um, just listening through the audiobooks at the moment because it gives a slightly different start, uh, slant on things. It emphasizes stuff that perhaps you might not have emphasized yourself when you're just reading it on the page. And the I think it's Martin Shaw is reading the uh, the Silmarillion, the version that I'm uh, listening to, and he's an excellent actor, and he uh, is very clearly enunciating everything as well, which is very important in the Silmarillion. In terms of some highlights, uh, the kind of things that are I'm coming up with this time, I've just been uh, uh, doing the War of Wrath, which is when. Um, we get uh, Morgoth's downfall. That uh, is something that I'd. It, it's a huge epochal change within Middle Earth. So that is absolutely uh, fascinating. Uh, Baron and Luthien is a fantastic story. I was absolutely loving that when I was listening to that one. And then um, I think the other thing that I would go back and pick up on is some of the. It's fantastic when you're reading something like the Silmarillion, which is set thousands of years before the events of the Lord of the Rings, when you suddenly hear mentions of characters like Galadriel or Elrond or someone like that, and you actually see where they come from or when they were young characters, um, what was going on with them before uh, the characters, the old, wise, great characters that they are in the Lord of the Rings. So those are just a few things I would pick up on there. Um, Tobias Gulka, thank you so much, saying, do you buy into LML's meteor theory? It makes sense to me and seems to explain a whole lot about planetos. Um, well, I, I mean, I'm not going to go into all of what LML's meteor theory is. Um, I sort of is the short answer. I think that my general take is I study the plot and characters of A Song of Ice and Fire a lot more than people who belong in that side of the community who look a lot more at the symbolism of things. So uh, I think perhaps some of the things that uh, emerge from there probably are less relevant to the current plot than uh, the kinds of things that I tend to bring out. Now, uh, do I subscribe to it? And I say sort of. I I like the idea that there's a uh, that the meteor which um, or meteorite which came down and uh, landed on uh, Starfall, and from which the um, uh, the sword dawn came from. Uh, I love the idea that that perhaps uh, formed Lightbringer. So I, that that works for me incredibly well. I I think the the idea that there were two moons. Do go and check it out if you want the details. It's it's. Um, uh, I would be doing it a disservice to try and 
paraphrase it, the details of two moons breaking up, I, I can largely take or leave personally. Um, I do like connecting this in with the weather. Um, uh, and I had a bit of an exchange on Twitter about this actually recently. Um, if I were to add tinfoil onto what I said about the weather and the seasons in Planetos, um, it would be that clearly I think that the non-tinfoil thing that I think that is reasonably clear is that the the seasons being out of balance in Westeros is caused by a, a magical event that is connected with the first long night. I think that is pretty incontrovertible. I think that this, for me, I think it makes perfect sense that this is the Children of the Forest's creation of or introduction of the others. I'm not currently... A hundred percent certain that you know, the way they showed it on the show is exactly right. You know, creation of the others. Maybe they brought them in from somewhere else. I I do not know. But whatever it was, it this was a seismic a bit of magic that was creating and introducing a new life form. And George R. Martin being very clear, this is a different kind of life. So that is the kind of thing which will have uh, affected the seasons, and something did something affected the seasons it's not supposed to be like that an event changed things and made it happen that i think is what set the uh, the earth's orbit slightly more wobbly whether in practice what that was was a moon um exploding um i don't know maybe that would have affected the um the orbit uh i my tinfoil was perhaps that 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 thing then created the meteorite which which Lightbringer came from, which then ended the long night, and that sort of creates a nice little magical cycle. But George R. R. Martin tells us not to look for scientific answers to this. This is a magical thing. It isn't any kind of idea that this was caused because there used to be two moons and now there's one moon. That is not right. It is the magical cause is the important thing here. So uh, I think that's where I go with it. If you're interested in that kind of thing, then please do go and check it out. Um, a question from Goodnight Carolina. Thank you for your great content. Oh, thank you. Uh, through this year, I'd be more thankful if I'd planned my Thanksgiving for after this. Looking forward to playback. Well, I hope you have a, a wonderful uh, Thanksgiving with uh, whoever you are celebrating it with. Um, Monkey Tron saying George R. R. Martin's Fever Dream audiobook is great, interesting vampires. I've read the book Fever Dream. It is excellent. It's after after A Song of Ice and Fire. It's my favourite George R. 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 Martin book. I haven't listened to the audiobook on that one. Um, question from... Let's go back to some questions from my patrons. Sam Klontz the second saying hello robert been listening to uh, fire and blood lately and i've been wondering how they might adapt it for house of the dragon uh, being there is so little dialogue and that it is from a narrator pov could you give your thoughts on the format you think the show will take and if you if you think they'll fill the holes in history for example what happened between damon and rhaenyra or what really happened between lord rogar and Corianne wild okay so the the way I think they will film this and frame this and do this is as close to the way they did Game of Thrones as possible. I think that if we learn anything from the fact that they decided not to go for the original idea for a spin-off for a prequel, The Long Night One, and instead they decided to go for something with Targaryens and dragons, it's that they realised that what people like is Targaryens and dragons. They enjoyed Game of Thrones. I think they were going to go for the uh, most likely uh, to be a success as they possibly can. They're not going to do any different kinds of storytelling. Now, what does that mean in terms of the bits of history that are presented in Fire and Blood as being mysteries. I think that they will probably try to allow them to be mysteries. Maybe some of them they might give more hints on the TV show. They might do a little bit of dramatic license with a few of them. But on Game of Thrones, then they certainly allowed for there to be 
gaps that we did not see action happening and that therefore we just had to sort of read between the lines. That worked on the TV show. So, for example, uh, who, uh, who hired the assassin to kill Bran? They set that up as a mystery and then never really answered it on the TV show on the in the books then I think we can tie a few extra things together to try and come to an answer but I think they will allow that to happen on the spin-off TV show is that there are some things where you go okay so why is this person doing this uh, oh and somebody speculates that maybe it's because of such and such I think that they will allow those gaps to remain rather than trying to fill exactly what it is. We're still having effectively, yes, a TV programme is not the same as having POV um, as we have on the books, but it does still rely on choosing what bits to show and what bits not to show. So we don't ever see all of Littlefinger's planning. We just have to work it out on the basis of what's there. And some of it, we have to go, well, maybe that wasn't him, or maybe he was doing something that we didn't know about. Um, uh, question from, uh, yes, yeah, so, and also the other thing in the uh, the spin-off, the original spin-off, um, Crowd and Tackers, I assume you're talking about this, was the rumours are it was a hot mess. It's entirely possible that it was just very bad. We do not know. We have not seen it. But it is very clear that it was also not where they were wanting to go conceptually with this to something which was uh, going to be very edgy with none of the main houses or, or bits of world that we knew about so it, effectively a completely new show with a huge budget they weren't going that they wanted to do something that they were pretty convinced would work uh merlin uh cam saying uh love your content thank you very much you've a very nice and enjoyable listen to voice thank you especially the tolkien vids are you planning to do elder scrolls or more black mordor um well i'm not uh, at the moment planning on doing any games i do love the elder scrolls stuff um in particular now if they made it into tv show then i might consider it but for the time being no the the way so you're aware of what's coming up on this channel over the next year i've just been trying to do a little bit of forward planning what's what i'm going to be doing i'm mainly focusing still on two things which is a song of ice and fire i'm going to carry on with that maybe we'll get a book uh, certainly at some point we're going to get the spin-off uh, but i'm going to carry on with the song of ice and fire i'm going to carry on with the tolkien stuff um all through the year latest estimate is perhaps in a year's time then we might get the lord of the rings tv show very excited about that. So those two are the mainstays of this channel going forward over the next year. But there are other things that I would like to cover or I'm considering covering. I did a, a few videos on The Witcher when season one came out. I think I will probably do the same again next year. Again, we schedules are a little bit skewed at the moment, obviously, by COVID-19. Uh, but the aim at the moment seems to be for that to be on our screens late summer next year. I will do some videos around that sort of time as well. I am interested and intrigued by the Wheel of Time TV series. I'm working my way back, back through those books right now. And if it's good, I may well cover that too. So that's what I've what, what I've got going on, obviously, as a I'm sure you know I love Westworld. When that returns for the next season, uh, then I will cover that as well. Uh, that probably won't be until 2022, I wouldn't have thought. Uh, but that's what I've got uh, going forward, as well as my second channel, obviously, The Well-Told Tale, which is my audio narration channel for great classic uh, science fiction uh, and fantasy stories. Uh, Joanna Hepburn saying, Hi Robert, I'm absolutely fascinated by Hard Home and some of its apparent parallels with Old Valyria. It too seemingly fell to some cataclysmic meteor impact event and was left scorched and ruined. 
flames burned so high it was like the sun rising. It is viewed as a cursed wasteland full of horrors. What do you think happened there all those centuries ago? And Mother Mole also gives a prophecy that the free folk will find salvation where they once found damnation and leads her followers to hard home to await this. What do you think this means for the past, present and future? And then finally, if John survives, uh, could he be heading there after at the end of all of the story? Um, so in terms of what happened, it is a mystery. It's deliberately a mystery. I don't buy into, so for those who don't know, Hard Home, which we saw on the show, there was that epic battle there where the, um, the wildlings were, some of the wildlings were rescued uh, by Jon Snow and the, uh, the Night's Watch. Um, but then the Whites attacked and there was that standoff between the Night King and, and Jon Snow. That's not happening in the books there is hard home stuff happening in the books uh, a lot of the wildlings have gone over there the night's watch have dispatched a few ships up there but it's not the same kind of and there is a plan to send more troops over land up there some of the wildlings back up there but that's not at the moment it would appear the what anything like what happened on the show now it is uh, uh we think of it as the wildling city but it was and then there was this huge explosion hundreds of years ago i think it was six seven hundred years ago and nobody really knows what it was uh, and it is this complete mystery now we're not given many clues i've seen some people speculating that perhaps this is somebody doing like a dry run before old valeria if so it it was a couple of hundred years before all before uh, the doom of valeria so it would have to be somebody very long lived or somebody very very patient so i that doesn't quite add up for me i think it for me yes this kind of meteorite hit or something like that does seem to be the most likely but then there was the burning it's hard. This was a mystery that George R. Martin has put in there, and he's not yet given us anywhere near enough clues to understand what was actually going on. And that's fine, because we've not been there yet in the books. We've not seen it. This is just a, a thing that we hear about in passing. So I, I'm not, I don't think this is central to the plot. My best guess, as I say at the moment, is this was a massive meteorite or something along those lines, but we don't know. Mother Mole is this leader of the uh, of some of the free folk um, who gets this vision of a fleet of ships who will take the free folk to safety across the narrow sea, and so she uh, she heads over there with uh, to Hard Home, which is the sea and uh, brings a whole load of people with her and then she's heard talking as you say here about finding salvation where once they found damnation now as it stands that doesn't seem to be working out for them um some uh, some ships did magically appear on the coast and some um of the free folk did get to go over to the uh to essos but these were slaver ships and now one of them was taken by bravos um and the slaves were freed and so yes some of the free folk did indeed seem to get uh by a rather circuitous route uh o over the narrow sea to safety uh but a lot of them didn't and now obviously we're getting the whites attacking and all the rest of it and it's not looking good for them and the ships that are there or thereabouts uh, are diminished in number the night's watch and probably won't be able to take everyone and even if they did they wouldn't be going across the narrow sea so this is not looking good at the moment but uh she I mean, we don't know much about Mother Mole. We don't know whether to trust her or not, but pe clearly the people did. And um, I think that what we should look at is in the same way on the show, if you cut out the daring rescue attempt, which actually didn't rescue that many, what you're left with is the purpose of Hard Home 
is that narratively is that it created a massive army for the others for the white walkers and i think that is what is going to happen again the wildlings are all gathered in one place and the others are going to get them so i think that's pretty pretty much where we're going in terms of if john survives uh will he head there i don't personally think so um so um if it's still if it's still surviving uh then uh maybe but i don't think we're going to get that amount of information i think we will just see him head north and that's it i think that is going to be his his ending um asma k thank you so much for the super sticker i very much appreciate that um also had uh, merlin conher saying um Black Mirror, uh, yes, uh, so that makes sense. Uh, in terms of more Black Mirror, I did do one Black Mirror um, video with the last season. Now, um, I love Black Mirror. Black Mirror was excellent. The first few seasons were as good as science fiction gets. The last season, I will admit, I was left feeling a little underwhelmed by. Uh, if when the next season of Black Mirror comes out, and uh, I hope it will at some point soon. They don't tend to, actually Netflix with Black Mirror, they don't tend to trail it much. They often just release a trailer the day before and say, hey, Black Mirror is about to drop, um, which works perfectly well for Black Mirror because it works very word of mouth. But um, I think I will watch them and then decide if I want to make videos on them this time around. So uh, yeah, I do love Black Mirror. Um, I think Charlie Brooker is, uh, Pretty a, a genius when he he's uh he gets it right. Ariel Winchester, thank you so much for the super sticker. I really appreciate that. I've got a question from you coming up later as well. Um, I will make sure that I get to that. Nicola Trickler saying, uh, thank you for your content. Um, you are incredibly insightful and a very lovely person. Thank you. That's very kind. Uh, would you share with us some of your unpopular opinions on A, Song, a Song of Ice and Fire? Uh, unpopular opinions. I, well, judging on purely on the amount of people who seem to disagree with me in the comments section on my videos, I think my uh, faith and belief that we are going to see the winds of winter at some popular with some people i think that it gets beyond absolutely anything else i've ever said M my assumption that we are going to be able to read the winds of winter is the one that is most disagreed with i have to say um so i guess that's probably my most unpopular one in terms of i will throw something else out there that i'm as i said i'm going through a read through or listen through again of uh, all of the Game of Thrones books, I'm going to, all of A Song of Ice and Fire, started with book one, and I'm, I don't know, seven, eight chapters in, and what I'm doing is I'm listening to it this time rather than reading it, and I'm doing it just a chapter by, uh, at a time, and I'm putting a few reflections up over on Twitter after every chapter, um, things that I hadn't picked up on before, pardon me, things I hadn't picked up on before, or things that, um, looking back i realize the significance of more than i did at the time that kind of thing so i'm trying to look at these things with a fresh pair of eyes or listen with a fresh pair of ears if that works um which is a bit of a preamble to say that this is allowing me the chance to reassess characters and situations and things um in a way that probably i didn't or couldn't when i was reading it and so I'm looking to see if there are any characters I get slightly different views on as as we go through it. And the one that has, I don't know whether surprised me the most, but has been most obvious has been Kat, who in the two chapters of hers that I've read so far, she comes across as being really quite politically savvy, which wasn't a thing that I'd picked up on before. Certainly in in contrast to Ned, 
who doesn't. He, he doesn't seem to understand the implications of things that are going on. There are a couple of times when she gives him information, then she's like sitting there waiting for him to work through the implications of it, um, knowing that he'll get there, but it'll take him a little while. Um, there are, I'm not saying that she's perfect by any means. We've already seen that the reason John goes to the wall is because she refuses to let him stay in Winterfell while Ned has gone. And that is one of what I suspect is going to be quite a few instances when her decisions are going to have some quite far-reaching consequences in this story. But in terms of her as a character, her her political mouse is something that I had not picked up on before. So I'm, I'll be interested to see whether that carries on uh, through the rest of the story. It would work thinking about it, given the fact that the Starks tend to be and Ned Stark has largely stayed up in the North since the war um, and tried to stay away from politics. Cat grew up in the South, um, in the Riverlands, and was very aware of politics. So that will be something that she we would expect her to be better at than the Starks. So it will be interesting to see whether that develops going through. And I, when I put that under unpopular opinions because I'm aware that quite a lot of people uh, aren't big fans of Cat. Uh, but I'm uh, hopefully starting to see a different side of her going through this. Now, um, a question from... Uh, Eric Fug and actually uh, Eric this, we, I had a super chat from you earlier on I just wanted to mention it here just because I've got the, your questions over on Patreon uh, so thank you so much for that uh, but your question is who actually killed little Walder Frey now this for those who do not know when we're getting towards the end of the books uh, Dance with Dragons we've got the situation, I sort of touched on this a little bit when I was talking about the Great Northern Conspiracy, but in Winterfell, you have the Boltons who are in charge, and there's this whole mass of other people who are all gathered there. It's getting very cold outside. The snowdrifts are, uh, are getting tens of feet thick. Uh, six of the seven gates of Winterfell are frozen shut. Um it's they've not got enough food to feed everyone in there going through even a normal length winter so this is a very fraught atmosphere lots of infighting happening now there are a whole string of murders that happen in winterfell and the culmination of this is the death of this guy called little walder frey who is one part of the huge Frey family tree and he um, was getting very closely involved with Ramsay he was sort of acting as his squire effectively and was starting to pick up on a lot of Ramsay's habits and then he ends up dead so he's killed he's still a child um, and he's killed and then he's left somewhere in a snowdrift and is found a little bit later. This is important because um, the phrase then accuse the Mandalays of doing this. And Wyman Mandalay is um, uh, it's one, of, one of the possibly unwisest but best comebacks. Um, says uh, it is uh, it is perhaps... Uh, perhaps for the best, because if he had grown up, then he would probably grow up to be a Frey. Um, and that immediately sends the phrase uh, into this uh, vengeful attack on uh, and in on the Mandalays within Winterfell, and Roose Bolton has to get sort of effectively get them forcibly restrained from one another, and then basically just sends both the Freys and the Mandalays out of Winterfell. He says, right, go go attack the uh, the um, Stannis' army. He realises that he cannot have these two uh, armies at each other's throats in Winterfell. And if he gets rid of them, maybe they'll kill Stannis and destroy Stannis' army. And if so, he wins, uh, or maybe they will just attack each other, in which case he's got more food to go around in Winterfell. So that's the background to it. And so the question is, given that this sparks a whole load of stuff, who actually does do this? Now, 
one option is that yes this actually is the mandalese not actually one mandalese himself but perhaps he um got somebody to do it now um that's entirely possible. Wyman Mandley hates the phrase. He blames them for the death of his son, Red Wedding. Um, and so it's entirely possible there have been a string of murders which appear to have been done by um, Mance Raiders' spearwives, at least they're claiming them, but they say that this one was not them. So it's entirely possible that the Mandleys thought, you know what, we can get away with this because there's a whole load of murders going on anyway. So you know, we'll add a fray onto the list. Um, so that's option one. Option two, I think, is um, Big Walter Frey. Now, he's um, uh, he's a cousin. He's another part of this Frey family. He's a cousin of little Walter Frey. And he has been, although they seemed to come as a package when they were sort of uh, initially introduced and they're sort of going off and doing stuff together, he grows increasingly concerned about little Walder Frey and the little Walder Frey is big, big, big Walder Frey is little. Do they find it amusing? And uh, he um, gets increasingly concerned about what little Walder Frey is like and he clearly bears a grudge against him uh, and is ambitious. He basically, it's, it's put to him that neither of them will ever uh, be uh, the lord of the phrase and he goes well i will and it's like okay how do you how, how do you think that's going to happen a lot of people have to die and one of the people in the line of succession between him and that is little walder Frey. so perhaps it's him and there is also a hint when he comes in we uh, we get told that his face is splattered with blood which uh why would it be unless he'd just been killing someone or something we don't know so those are the two options my best guess probably actually is the latter but i wouldn't put it past the mandalies in the slightest the, from a plot perspective i don't think this matters i don't think it matters who did it what what matters is that impact on what uh on the story after that the fact that the phrase and the um, Mandalies are then going to be heading out. That, I think, is the important thing. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the, it's one of those two, and my money would probably be on uh, big slash little Walder Frey. Uh, Dornish Dan saying uh, Thanksgiving, and hi there, Dornish Dan saying Thanksgiving Day here. I am thankful still for all of the travelogues and the other work you do too. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, yeah, so the Traveler's Guides... Um, uh, yeah, they they got a, a dedicated audience, and I'm I'm it's some of some of my some of the work I'm most proud of. Uh, so thank you. I'm really glad you appreciate them. If you haven't come across them, then uh, do have a look on the YouTube channel. Um, there's a playlist or two with the travelers' guides to Westeros and Essos. Uh, Wolf Wilson saying hi, Robert. I'm really keen to hear your thoughts on if you think the White Walkers are an allegory. I've heard a lot of people say they're representative of either climate change or the psychological other, and wonder what your view is on this. I think, so George R. R. Martin is very clear that they are not an allegory. He is not writing an allegory where you have, you know, this represents that and that represents the other and all the rest of it. That's not what he's about. It, he's very similar to Tolkien in that Tolkien he had his whole introduction to the Lord of the Rings was saying how this is not an allegory for all these different things. Um, so he's very clear on that. And I think he's actually even specifically said, this is not the white walkers. The others are not an allegory for climate change, but he is obviously very happy for people to be taking applications from what he, um, what he has written. And that is something that a lot of people have done, and I think that he's not sought to dissuade them from is taking this idea that climate change, there's clearly a, a link, climate change and the others, the others are literally changing the climate and lots of people are denying the existence of the others and so on. So I think that, yes, that is clearly something that he has allowed people to be 
taking as an application without it being an allegory. In terms of them being um, uh, psychological, sorry, the, the psychological other, I, again, I don't think that this is a specific allegory, but I think that his choice of the others is a deliberate one, using this idea of othering, this idea that um, if you do not understand something, if you do not um, see much of yourself in uh, another person or group or whatever, then you may other them, but you say they are not like us, and you create a barrier between you and them, and uh, assume that they are all bad or worse than they are, or stuff like that. I think that is deliberate. Creating a wall between us and the others is, I think, very clear and deliberate on George R. Martin's point. As I say, it's not an allegory. He's definitely not doing an, an allegory, but he is creating these concepts that I think he allows people to draw those kind of applications from. Jordan Walker, thank you so much, saying thank you for all the brilliant content. Thank you. How will Jamie react to Brienne taking him to Lady Stoneheart? Will he feel betrayed or be forgiving? Um, this is it's a really interesting one. I think he will he will feel tricked by her. Undeniably, he will feel tricked by her because she's said, you know, I can. I can take you to the Hound, and she's not. She's taking him to uh, Lady Stoneheart. Now, so I think he will. But at the same point, we there's this incredibly complicated set of connecting promises and vows um, linking those three characters. So... Uh, Brienne made vows to Catelyn. Then also we get Jamie making vows to to Catelyn. Uh, then we we get um, Brienne and uh, effectively taking on Jamie's vows in, for Catelyn, and it just creates this strange little circle of who actually owes somebody else their loyalty or the. The completion of an oath. So I think that's going to be the main thing which is going to be coming out from this. And I think that he will understand that she has to do certain things in order to save not just her life, but also Pod's life, because she calls out uh, the the um, sword or noose she gets to, she gets to say sword i'm pledging my sword to you um and she calls that out when she sees that pod is also going to be killed so it's she probably or may have allowed herself to be killed but she could not stand by and allow uh, an innocent person to be killed and i think that jamie will understand that element of it um, question from Kevin Stevens, thank you, saying, I've been watching for years and never caught a live show before. It's not much, but I wanted to show my appreciation. Here's to many more years. Thank you. Well, Kevin, thank you so much. Uh, if this is your first time watching, then welcome, um, particularly if you've been watching for years and uh, this is the first time you've caught it live. Um, it's a very different experience watching them uh, live, so thank you. And if this is your first time watching this live, then, th then welcome to you too. Um, uh, and that's, uh, that's very kind of you with the super chat as well. Um, let's go to a question from uh, Mara Lee. Actually, Mara, you did a uh, super chat, actually, as I'm talking about them, uh, before we went on air, saying, Happy Thanksgiving to all who are in celebration in the USA. Thank you, Robert, for all the fabulous content and marvellous stories and for the fabulous merch. Just got my T-shirts and mugs in the mail yesterday. Um, so, uh, and also a super sticker. So, Mara, thank you. Now, I said last week when I was launching the website and the merch that I'm not very good at this and I always forget to bring uh, merch. And last week I remembered and I had merch to show you. Obviously, this week I've forgotten again. So, if you're interested in merch, then go to indeepgeek.com. Uh, uh, I wish I could show you, but I. I kind of like, I think it's good. Um, uh, so please do go and check it out. But Mara, thank you so much. I'm glad that you're 
enjoying it. Um, you say um, in previous live streams, there has been discussion about what the prologue of the Winds of Winter could be about Jane Westerling, Rob Stark's widow. What cliffhanger do you think the Winds of Winter will end with? And what do you think the prologue will be for the Dream of Spring? Um, so in terms of the cliffhanger from the Winds of Winter, my take is that the story will end when ice and fire both arrive in Westeros. I think that is where we're going to get to Danny, and what I mean by that is Danny will be gathering her forces and coming across all the way over and landing somewhere, probably Dragonstone, because of the historical link for her uh, and the fact it's not particularly well defended at the moment. Um, and so that's uh, dragons will arrive in Westeros and up in the north, the others will breach the wall. And so I think we will get ice and fire suddenly arriving at both ends of Westeros. I think that is where the story is going to end. In terms of the uh, sort of the cliffhanger, I don't know if it's going to be a cliffhanger, but I personally think they will probably, or George R. Martin will probably end it uh, with the wall falling or being breached or the others coming through or however it works. I think that is probably the most dramatic moment for um, for that because that changes the game completely in the North. Now, he might even do that as an epilogue. He, he uses prologues and epilogues with characters who um, you, you don't, they're, they're not general POV characters and they're pretty dispensable. Um, so it's entirely possible that he could do this as somebody who is a lookout on the wall, seeing the others approaching and going through or something along those lines. That would be, if I were him, that would be how I would write it. In terms of how the prologue or what the prologue will be for A Dream of Spring, I think that's probably still a little too far away to speculate on that other than to say that what he tends to use prologues for is to introduce a concept that will be important in that book. For example, Varamir Sixskins introduced us to the concept of when you die as a skin changer, you can then go and put your spirit, your soul into the body of your bonded animal. And for him, this was a wolf. So we have this concept that you can then, when you die of your skin changer, you can then go and put your spirit into a wolf. And then we, uh, towards the end, we see this Jon Snow dying. So that is what he's trying to do, is introduce the concept there that will be important later in understanding what happens later on in the book. So what is it, what is it that we're going to see in A Dream of Spring that will need a concept introduced? I, at the moment, the only thing I can do is this idea of both ice and fire. That's where I think it is. I think that a lot of people will go into A Dream of Spring still just thinking about the threat from the north, the threat from ice. And George R. R. Martin, I think, is going to be trying to bring us around to this idea that both ice and fire can destroy the world. That is what he is trying to be saying to us. And so I think he might show that in... A prologue, but as I say, it's a long way away still. Anthony Coleman, thank you so much. Saying, Hi Robert, how certain will the hold the door moment be in the text? Could the name of the great other be Hodor? Wouldn't that be ironic? Yeah, I noticed there's a Norse god of darkness closely named that. Uh, well, on this one, we actually have some relatively recent additional information from George R. R. Martin himself. Now, it was in the book um, Fire Cannot Kill a Dragon. I did a video, I don't know, a month or maybe a little bit more on that called something like Eight New Clues uh, About the Winds of Winter. And uh, that as a book, it was a book about the TV show but um, it was basically a collation of lots of different and sort of ordering of lots of different interviews with the showrunners, with George R. R. Martin, with the actors, with lots of other people. And 
they are reflecting on what happened in the TV show and all the rest of it. And most of it, as I say, is about the TV show. But sometimes there are some things that are about the books because George R. R. Martin in particular talks about the differences between the show and the books. And one of the things that he did in this uh, in this book, he specifically addressed was Hodor and Hold the Door. And what he said was that he liked what they did on the show. He, he thought they did it very well. But he thought that um, they did it in a way which was very literal and, and physical, in that Hodor was literally holding a door. And he said that's not what is going to be in the books. It's not a literal holding a door. And he goes on to explain that what he means is you could in the same way that militarily you might say to a, a squad of people hold that pass or something like that you might say to Hodor hold the door as in hold the doorway now he then goes on to talk about Hodor um, or Bran having been walking into Hodor uh, doing his practice with his sword and so immediately we've got a very clear different idea about what is going on with Hodor is that Hodor is yes and this is a, a technical difference from George, George R. R. Martin um, he is going to be dying it would appear whilst being walked into by Bran not literally holding a door, but in a doorway with a sword, fighting off the bad guys, presumably so Bran and Mira can escape. So it's going to be quite similar, but it's actually going to be with fighting rather than just literally holding a door. Now, this opens up huge amounts of extra possibilities that I've speculated on several times. The one that I find most fascinating is this idea of if this is Hodor actually having to fight um, the Whites, the others, who knows? How's he going to do that with a normal sword? He's just got this rusty old sword from Winterfell at the moment. That's not going to do much good. The only type of sword that would be effective if he is using a sword, as George R. Martin suggests, is a Valyrian steel sword. There is a Valyrian steel sword almost certainly in Blood Raven's cave, so perhaps perhaps we're looking at him using Dark Sister. It's just where the logic goes. It's not certain at all. What is certain is that the, ho the Hodor holds the door moment is going to be him fighting off the bad guys rather than him just holding a door. Um, in, in terms of what you're talking about with the, the great other, um, I don't well, George R. Martin has been very clear, we are not going to see the gods in his story. And, and that goes as much as it goes for like R'hllor or anything like that, that also goes for the Great Other. We're going to be left to speculate whether the Great Other is even a thing. The only people who talk about the Great Other are priests of R'hllor. This is just their concept of where, who their great enemy is. That there's, we don't at the moment have anything other than people who are uh, possibly imagining a great uh, god who is their great god is up against. We do not know any further details than that. So um, it's a good idea, but we're, we're almost certainly not going to be shown it uh, in any way. Um, yeah, the, but the idea of uh, him being a Norse, he does come across being quite. Uh, like a Norse god in a way. I certainly get that. Um, question from Eric Fogg saying, what was Jacken doing in the Black Cells? This, uh, this is Jacken Hagar. This obviously is going all the way back to book one. And... Uh, I did do a video on this a long time ago. I, I'm going to say three years ago. So if you're wanting my longer, more thought out answer to this, then I, it's called something you can search for. It's called something like, why was Jacken in King's Landing? Now, the I probably won't be able to 
replicate all of my logic from that, but it goes something along the lines of Jacken clearly wanted to be in the black cells. He's not going to be caught doing random stuff and then just sitting there. He's far too uh, good at his job to just be caught and flung in the cells with other people. That is not at all likely. So he is there because he wants to be there. Why does he want to be in the black cells? Well, the options are, it would appear, either because he wants to kill somebody while he is in the black cells, we don't hear of him doing that, or he wants to kill somebody afterwards, having been released from the black cells, because that provides him with the right cover. Now, that for me is the most likely. He will probably have discovered that the um, the Night's Watch, and there's a Yorin from the Night's Watch, has come down and he has been given uh, the opportunity to go to the Black Cells and take people with him up to the wall. So Jacken will know that if he is in the Black Cells, there's a good chance that he will be part of this group going up who are going to be joining the Night's Watch. So he wants to be in that group. Who else was going to be in that group? Now, it's not Arya or Gendry. They were late additions to this. We don't... It's it's not that. The person who was supposed to be in that group was Ned Stark. He... That was supposed to be what was going to happen. This was why there was, there was that look of shock on everyone's face when um, suddenly... Um, uh, Joffrey uh, announced that you know Ned was going to have his head chopped off. He wasn't supposed to do that. The implication is that the person who suggested that was Littlefinger. Littlefinger, under no circumstances, could allow Ned Stark to get north again he that he could not allow that at all because ned stark would uh, at that point he knew too much he knew a lot about what little fingers um uh, maneuverings were and there is absolutely no way that he could little finger could allow ned to go north so he had to make sure ned was killed the first part of that idea was obviously to try and get him killed by joffrey that worked, but he had to have a backup plan. He had to have a plan for if that did not work. Now, I think the backup plan was to hire a faceless man to kill him as that group goes north. So that is why he was there. The If you go through a Game of Thrones book one, you see the person who suspiciously knows the most about the faceless men, about how much they cost, all those kinds of things is Littlefinger. He is clearly the person, if anyone has hired a faceless man, he is the person all the clues point to. Now, that also explains, if we have this idea that that was Jacken's plan, that explains why Jacken then um, just didn't seem to be doing any big assassin assassinating of anybody afterward. He came out and then that's it. Something, however, caught his eye, and that was Arya, and that was why he hung around for a bit longer. That all, for me, kind of adds up, makes sense. Why Jacken was in the Black Cells? Because he wanted to be in the Black Cells. The only reason why he would want to be in the Black Cells is either to kill someone there or to kill somebody under cover of having been somebody in the Black Cells. So that is the, the train of logic I've got going on there. But as I said, if you want to, uh, do have a look for that video. Stephen Dillon, uh, thank you so much, saying, hello, won't be able to watch uh, live tonight, but look forward to seeing it later. My question is, how do you think a romance between John and Danny would go? The biggest hint we've seen the no in the novel so far is the blue rose at the wall smelling sweet, but uh, which was in the uh, visions that Danny had at the House of the Undying. But every other time in the books where something smells sweet, it is always negative. Do you think it'll be a hostile relationship? I don't. Uh, I don't think so. Um, personally, I think that uh, all the. Well, I think that the attraction bit seems quite clear. Both of their characters, from what we've seen of what they each look for in a partner, Danny 
with Carl Drogo and also Dario seems to be going for um, these kind of fighters, leaders of men, that kind of strong uh, character that John does fit into. Um, and John seems to be attracted to uh, strong women who not just the sort of the... Um, the kind of person who would be sort of sitting doing all of their lacing and all the rest of it, but actually going out and, and doing things. Uh, and that certainly seems to be Danny. So I think that the attraction is probably going to be quite uh, likely. I think that and on the show, they sort of hinted at it, but didn't really go there. But the, I think people like Tyrion will definitely notice the fact or be aware of the fact that if John is by this point King of the North, he is the best bet for Danny to marry. If if we take Fagon out of the equation, which I think we probably will have to relatively soon, he is the best bet for her to marry because he will be able to bring the North and then through his links, um probably the the Vale, the Riverlands and other places like that. He is the logical person politically for her to be marrying. So I think that that is, that is what is going to be there. I think the attraction will be there uh, as well. And I think that um, will it be a, a hostile relationship? I don't think hostile is probably the right word, but I would say it's probably going to be fiery. Um, let's put it that way. John's relationships and Danny's relationships thus far have not been easy. There's always been friction going on between them and their partners. And I think we're going to see that again. So I think hostile is the wrong word, but I think definitely there is going to be a, a degree of friction as well as um, a clear and obvious attraction. Ultraviolence, thank you so much, saying no question this week. Today, I am thanks you are streaming as a nice background for cooking Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, well, thank you so much. I very much appreciate that, and uh, I hope you have a lovely dinner. Um, I, I, did, I do quite often wonder what people do when they're uh, watching this or listening to this, and uh, it, I think it brings me a, a reasonable degree of joy to know that people may well be cooking for, for themselves and their loved ones on this time. So uh, thank you. I do a uh, appreciate that very much. Um, question from, um, I didn't actually note down who this was, so apologies, but from one of my patrons saying, uh, Mance Raider is still alive in the books. Oh, I think this might have been Mara Lee, actually, uh, saying Mance Raider is still alive in the books. What do you think will be his final fate in the last two books? Um, so... Yes, Mance Raider is alive in the books. Now, he he has had a couple of important roles so far. The first one, obviously, is getting the wildlings south of the wall. The second one is facilitating the release of Theon, but that is not the end of his role. I think that his the next place for him to be is the Winterfell Crypts, and I think this is going to be absolutely fundamentally important because he is going to... He is going to be down there. He's um, disguised himself as somebody called Abel the Bard, which is very much um, uh, an anagram of Baal the Bard, which is an ancient uh, legend of uh, or history of the Starks, where you get this character who went down into the Winterfell crypts and, um, well, he um, kidnapped the uh, the daughter of the. Uh, the King of Winter, Winterfell, and then came up and they had a child and he disappeared again. Uh, and he was uh, a king beyond the wall. And although that exact story won't happen, I think that the idea that he is going to come down as a king beyond the wall and then hide in Winterfell's crypts, I think that that, is, that echoing is clearly going to be happening now. Added to which his spear wives have been asking about how to get down into the crypts, what's going on. So he's clearly trying to find this out. So I think he is going to be hiding down there while whatever happens uh, for the next little while in Winterfell happens. And, and when I say whatever happens, there'll be some sort of battle. Stannis cannot stay camped outside in the freezing weather all this time. There has to be an assault on Winterfell at some stage. But while that is, well, the build up to that is happening, then Stannis is going to be down in the crypts and he's not the kind of person just to sort of sit in the corner and not do anything for a while. I think he'll be investigating. 
And what will he be looking for? Well, he has been looking for, north of the wall, he spent months, years, looking for the Horn of Winter. And he was looking in the tombs of dead heroes and kings. He's now got a whole load of tombs of dead heroes and kings. It makes absolutely perfect sense to me that he is going to be having a little nosy around the Stark crypts, the Winterfell crypts, just to see what he can find. And I think that there would be a great irony if he finds, um, if he is the person who gets beyond that, there's a, a collapsed section of the crypts. I believe it is a deliberately collapsed section of the crypts. I'm not going to go into my whole theory on that one, but I imagine he will be the person who's going to get behind there and see what's behind there. And it would... I think there will be some great irony if after all of his time looking for the the Horn of Winter north of the Wall, he then discovers half of it south of the Wall, because let's not forget the, uh, the Horn that Sam has that we think of as the Horn of Winter is broken, we're told, and may, maybe that means that it's been broken into two. So that's my theory. He's definitely going to be doing something. In terms of what is his fate, I suspect that is probably the end of his main role in this story. So, um, and after that, I think that John does need to be taking over as the de facto leader of the wildlings. So, uh, or the free folk. So I think that probably he will at some point die after that, unfortunately. Um, question from Lee Roberts uh, saying, my question regards Septon Bath and his book Unnatural History. The Citadel condemned the book and King Baylor ordered all copies destroyed. Why do you think there's such a negative reaction to this book? Um, it's a good question. Because we we don't know everything that's in there what we do know is that he looked at um the history of dragons and speculated on how dragons might have been created there's also a section bizarrely we think of this as just being about dragons but there's also a section about ravens that says about how they used to be able to talk and the children of the forest used to use them to be transporting messages by telling them a message and then the raven would go off and speak it out to somebody else and septum bath apparently just sort of basically says so what the maester's doing these days is just not as good as used to be done by the children of the forest they've lost a lot of knowledge and all the rest of it what all of this adds up to in my view is a book that basically says, you know what, there are perfectly normal, magical explanations for a lot of the things we've got going on in the world right now, uh, dragons and the ravens and all the rest of it, and things are perhaps, perhaps we've lost knowledge going through time, perhaps there was more that there was back in the day, and all of the, and the maesters are not, not as good as they think they are, because they, they haven't managed to do, uh, to, perfect something that somebody else perfected all of this is exactly what the maesters don't want their worldview is that they are there advancing science and knowledge and progress they are trying to dampen down interest in magic the idea that you could do practical magic in order to achieve things they want all of that gone this is the book that fundamentally they disagree with they they might um some of them might technically agree with it, but they do not think it's the kind of thing that people should be reading. So I think that that is what is going on, uh, why the Citadel hated it so much. And I think the Citadel managed to get um, Baylor to, um, uh, to have it banned because they did not like it. I think that was what is going on. And I think that they could probably just come up with reasons why it might be heretical in the faith of the seven. So that I think is what is going on with that one. Um, Julia Erickson, thank you so much, saying, I was curious about your thoughts on why the wall seems to be a barrier for all kinds of magic, except for Bloodraven, who is able to warg animals and enter people's dreams on both sides of the wall. So 
this yeah th this is something with the wall it's noticeable that um, we get silverwing doesn't want to cross it obviously dragons are magical beings john cannot sense um ghost when they're on opposite sides of the wall uh, it is a magical barrier that means that um the others can't come across that it's it's preventing magic from going through blood raven however does seem to be unaffected by this and we have to and i think the right to ask why the reason i think is that blood raven's magic happens through the weirwood network now the weirwood network are connected so he can be sit sitting hooked up to a tree north of the wall and then the roots of that go deep underground all the way across uh, to weirwood trees everywhere and they and that includes going under the wall so my take is that that is the way that he can do it is that it's going under the wall rather than through it or over it pardon me through it or over it or anything like that that is the mechanism uh, by which he is able to continue to do magic by sort of dropping down going across and then coming back up at a weirwood tree on the other side of the wall so that seems to be the mechanism of, of what that is added to which um i should probably say i realized that was me putting my glasses on swiftly taking them off the other point here is that the wall was created with the magic of the children of the forest now the children of the forest it, clearly if they are going to be living both north and south of the wall which was their plan of course they will allow there to be a way for themselves to be communicating across there even if they're blocking every other kind of magic so that uh for me seems to be why blood raven is using children of the forest magic and um green seer magic rather than any other kind of magic um mara lee asks uh, or says drogon was the last surviving dragon uh, on the show um do you think he will be the last dragon in the books if so what will be his fate at the end of the series um yes i think that he will be the last dragon i think the more and, and i have to be wary of this simply because of the fact that i think i would love it if it happened um i think that we will see um the other two dragons fighting each other probably above the god's eye and probably with john and euron on i think that would be epic i think drogon will indeed survive and be the last in the same way that we get um valerian who was the last dragon who saw old valeria i think we're going to see um drogon who is the sort of the echo of Beleriand, is going to be the last dragon on westeros and i think that is what is going to be um where we're going to end up it, what what will his fate be i mean the, the way the tv show did it i thought was all right actually i mean i didn't particularly like him you know ignoring john and burning the iron throne those kinds of things but him picking up the body and then uh, flying off that does seem quite dragonish that's that's very much in line with the kinds of things that we do see from dragons there is that bond between them uh, and the their rider and so i could very much see that kind of thing happen so in the absence of something better then yes uh, perhaps drogon will get killed in the end but i i think i think george r. r martin likes the idea of not everything being neatly wrapped up at the end of the story and we will have um this possibility of uh, a dragon that has gone away and we don't know where it's gone uh Rigurd, thank you so much saying hi robert isn't it also ironic that if mance finds the horn uh, loads of the wildlings are already beyond the wall bringing it down with the horn will allow the others to pass endangering his people yes that is also ironic so i think th the question whether the horn of winter brings down the wall is is a much bigger one that i, I covered last time actually but 
if it does, then yes, it would be quite ironic that uh, having searched for it um, in a, an, att an apparent attempt to allow his people to escape south, uh, then this would actually just be letting the enemy near to them again. The, the fact is, though, that he appeared, at least this is what Tormund, Tormund was sort of speculating on, he appeared to be mostly wanting to use it as a bluff, uh, to say, uh, I will, this horn will bring down the wall, I will blow it if you don't let my people through. That seems to be what it was. And, and what they actually ended up doing was getting a horn that they didn't think was the Horn of Winter, but looked really cool, and they were going to use that uh, for that very purpose. So uh, that was where they were at. And I, whether he would ever have used it is still slightly up for debate, because Mance Raider is not stupid he will have known that if he brought the wall down to, in order to allow his um, wildlings to go through, his free folk to go through, then the wall is down and they're no more safe south of the wall than they were north of the wall. So it, it's the kind of thing that if there was the chance, it would have been interesting to see if his bluff was called, whether he would have actually gone through with it all. Uh, but yes, the irony of it does bring it down is is definitely there. Question from uh, Dan Hibbard saying, Hi, Robert, who do you think is the hooded man that Theon sees at Winterfell? Could it be Robert Glover or Howland Reed or a Stark soldier or just the hallucinations of a broken man? Keep up all the great work. Thank you so much. Uh, so this is something that gets a lot of focus for not much. When I say... Uh, for not much, for the amount of time uh, on the page this character appears. The Hooded Man appears once in the last, I think it's the last uh, Theon chapter uh, up in Winterfell, and it's just a passing encounter. Theon's gone for a little wonder, and then he comes across a hooded man who stares at him and says, Theon Turncloak, uh, Theon Kinslayer, and uh, puts his hand to his uh, sort of a dagger or something he's got there. Um, and Theon basically talks his way out of it and says, you know, you could kill me, but I'm I'm already there. Ram I'm already Ramsay's pet. He's and he shows his hand where it's been hugely disfigured, and then the hooded man goes, oh, well, I'll leave you to him then, and then carries on on their way. And it's it's never made clear whether Theon even recognises who this person is. They clearly recognise Theon, which is um, notable, and they clearly think about immediately trying to kill him and then decide not to simply because they thought that he might have a worse fate otherwise so who who is this who um calls theon theon turncloak theon kinslayer now it's very clear that this is somebody who knew him beforehand. It's clearly a Stark loyalist in some way on the basis of all of this. Could it be Howland Reed? I don't think so. I think Howland Reed is still down in the, um, uh, the neck, and I think that that's not really his style. I think that he will understand what Howland's role is going forward. I think Robert Glover, he was, when we last saw him, he was down in, um, I think he was down in um, White Harbour, so that's quite a long way away. A Stark soldier is, for me, the most likely. Somebody who was around and knew Theon when he was there, calling him Kinslayer, in because you know he is thought to have killed Bran and Rickon implies that he they are aware that he was you know, 
brought up with them effectively as being their brother um, as the ward and um, that is uh, uh, something immediately worthy of trying to kill him for so who, who is it can we put a name to this other than random stark soldier with a grudge now if i had to guess um hallis mollen is probably the best idea that we've got out there you can find a lot of different people being suggested this guy was he went south with the group uh with rob's army and he split off with them when we get uh cat catlin stark had ned's bones and then um she decided they should go up to Winterfell and she gets um, Hallis to take them up and then he disappears from the story. We don't know where he is. We know that there's all manner of problems in the way. The uh, the Boltons uh, take hold of the King's Road through or Moat Kaelin preventing going through the the neck we've got um barbary dustin who's keeping an eye out for the bones going anywhere near barrowton um we've got lots of people obviously all of the boltons would not wish ned stark's bones to be returning to winterfell so it, obviously he had to go to ground but his mission was to get back to winterfell with ned stark's bones and when he gets back up there if Yes, he's expecting to see the Boltons there, but if he suddenly sees Theon unexpectedly, then that would be the kind of response he would get. It also ties in with the fact that we do get um, a couple of random thematic things going on. We get this reminder of Ned's bones to Theon when we get Barbary Dustin talking about them. So that's supposed to be calling back to mind that, oh, I wonder where those bones have got to. It would make sense if we then uh, next time go across to suddenly see, even though we don't recognise him, uh, the person who was bringing them up. And also um, Theon goes on, it's a sort of a linguistic thing, uh, but you can see his train of thought in that chapter after the Hooded Man He's he then goes off and thinks that this castle is full of ghosts for him, and then he lists a whole load of ghosts, and that might that would seem to be a, a logical way to go for his brain to be going if he had seen somebody he thought might be dead. Um, now Hallis Mollin would know what. Theon looked like. He probably would have been vaguely aware of him, but probably thought that he died at the Red Wedding because he would have been unaware that he didn't end up there. So that would have been a surprise to him. So who is it? We do not know, but I think the most intriguing possibility is Hallis Mollen, which means that he has brought Ned Stark's bones back up to Winterfell, which means he's another character who we might expect to find down in the Winterfell crypts, which are going to become more and more important the deeper into the Winds of Winter that we go. Um, Turbo, thank you so much, saying, what are some things we will never find out? Oh, uh, I think there are lots of things. Um, one very small thing that I think we will never find out, but I, on my reread or read listen through uh, book one, um, struck me was we never found out who it was who delivered Lysa's message to Cat all the way back at the beginning. The one that said, um, you know, John Aaron, my husband, he was killed by the Lannisters. Now, in the books, that um, didn't arrive by Raven Mail. That arrived in a small box that had um, a little a lens in, a seeing lens in, um, and that was dropped and left in Maester Lewin's apartments um, while he was having a nap, I think. And... Maester Lewin is intrigued by this. He doesn't know where it's come from. He looks at it, and then he discovers that the box has got a secret compartment at the bottom, and that has got this message, which is for cat's eyes only. And so that is 
how it gets up there. The implication is that this is a free rider who came up with the King's Company, but we are, we're never told that this is somebody presumably that Littlefinger has bought, but we don't know. So that is one thing that I think that we will never actively find out the truth of there are probably a number of others i'd be interested in the chat perhaps if you want to drop down a few other things that you think we'll never find out for sure um uh, something there's a lot of the mysteries in fire and blood i suspect that we will never find out for sure i think that we'll never find out for sure what was in that letter that went to uh aegon the conqueror from the Prince of Dawn, I think we'll never find that one out for sure. There's a lot of other random mysteries that we will never find out for sure. Um, but uh, they make for good videos. Like uh, Who Killed Septon Moon <laughs> is a video that I'm I'm probably going to do at some point in the next week or two. I think we're never going to know for sure. Um, but um, in fact, I might have a question on it later, so I won't talk about it too much. But I think that we can speculate uh, on the basis of the information that we do have. Uh, so Turbo, thank you so much. Um, I think I did have another question somewhere. Um, where was oh reflective rambling? Thank you so much. Uh, oh, picking up a question for somebody else. I love it. Thank you. You do this quite a lot, um, uh, and I hugely appreciate this. Um, I don't. I can't always. The chat goes through very quickly, um, and I don't always pick up on all of the questions. And so, if people ask a question on behalf of somebody else and put it in a super chat, then I do spot it. So thank you very much, reflective rambling. Um, this is for fodder for foreshadowing. Ned never fostered his children, not even to trusted vassals like Reed or Manderley. Why do you think he kept them at home? Is this Ned just not being politically savvy? Um, partly, uh, yes, uh, this is, as I said a little bit earlier in the stream, this is one of the things that, be that comes out very clearly, is that um, whereas Cat is politically savvy, Ned isn't but i think that as much as anything else this is we have to imagine ned as being this guy although he's a strong leader and a loving father and all the rest of the things he's a guy with ptsd uh, to be honest from robert's rebellion he uh, gets nightmares about what happened um and he just wants to move away from it as much as possible if at all possible he has not left the north ever since robert's rebellion he had to on at least one occasion um but he seems to have decided that's it no i'm stopping in the north he i'm, I'm not gonna move out away from the north uh if at all possible this is my place and i do not want to get involved in southern politics at all so that mindset because Obviously, he might think that, you know, go, being down as well, and there's a chance that I, we could accidentally break the promise to, promises to Liana and all the rest of it. So um, I think this mindset of just steering away from everything else, just focusing in to his responsibilities in the North, I think that has played across to his children so it is um yes it's notable that he hasn't now some of them are too young anyway um rob um he didn't um um so and he could have done but he definitely seems to be wanting to keep everything him himself and his family in and close to him that seems to be a very important part of his personality and who he is um, and I think that that is as a result of what happened as much as anything else. Um, question from, well, let's go back to a question from my patrons. Um, Catherine Furseth saying, um, hi, Robert. What do you think will lead John to kill Danny in the end? A single single horrible act by her or rather because of what she has become and will have the potential to inflict on others in the future? So I do. Um, uh, I do think that John will kill Danny. I think I've 
done a few videos that touch on it from various different angles. Um, and I thought that way before season eight. Um, and that just sort of added to it. Why? I don't think it's that she's going to do a bad thing and then he's going to feel that he has to punish her for it or something like that. I think that he will see the damage that dragons can do. I think it's actually not so much going to be about her as seeing the damage that dragons can do and her commitment to uh, that and seeing her to having the dragons and using the dragons. So um, he is the kind of person who he's very earnest. He's doing the thing that he thinks is right, uh, even if that means hurting him personally. He's done, we, we saw that what happened with him and Agreed in many ways is this sort of a foreshadowing of what's going to happen, her dying in his arms and um, uh, him being in love, but then having to sort of abandon that because he has to do his duty. This is all this is all very foreshadowing of the kind of things we're going to be expecting from the, the John Daenerys relationship. I think it is going to be ending up with him feeling that he has to do this for the greater good in some way, and then hating himself for having had to do it. And I think that is where we're going to end up. It's going to be about the dragons. It's going to be about the potential of what could happen with the dragons in the future. It's not going to be just about... Um, punishing her for one single act that she's done um sylvester snow saying hello robert is it possible that the balor the blessed was also influenced by the same family prophecy of the prince that was promised being born from the targaryen line some of his actions uh, like the maiden vault and banning prostitution seem to indicate that he was already trying to prevent aegon the fourth from siring bastards that would later challenge the throne uh, thanks, as always, for all of you. This is interesting, a uh, different angle that looking at this. So Baelor the Blessed, for those who don't know, he was uh, that rare Targaryen king who just, he loved the faith of the Seven, and he got um, absolutely uh, focused in on this. He became incredibly pious. He would, um, tried to turn the Targaryens, this is after the dragons have gone, so after the Dance of the Dragons, so no dragons around anymore, basically tried to turn the Targaryens into um, monarchs who were monarchs of the Faith of the Seven, rather than what they had previously been very much were um, monarchs who had the Faith of the Seven as the kind of the state religion, but they felt that they were a above and different uh, to certain elements of its teachings. And he very much tried to bring them into the fold of it. Now, he went zealous. Uh, so he didn't just become you know, some nice little clergyman. Um, he went very, very zealous. So the Maiden Vault was uh, putting uh, Targaryens, locking them up, basically, uh, the female Targaryens, so that they... Uh, remained in his mind pure. Um, the banning prostitution, yep, because obviously that would not be pure. He, uh, as always, these things, what what being good is in his mind seems to equate to um, uh, banning lots of things to do with sex. Uh, but anyway, um, was it, the question is, was he being influenced by a family prophecy about the prince of the promised, uh, the prince that was promised being born from the Targaryen line. I don't personally think so. That the first time we hear about that prophecy is from the Woods Witch, and uh, she came much later. Now, um, the Woods Witch that became the ghost of High Heart. Now, it's possible the the language we have there imply it doesn't necessarily mean that she was the per person she might be picking up in this idea of the prince that was promised is going to be a targaryen and then she honed it into one specific targaryen line the language isn't entirely clear when we're told about what happened in that bit of history so it's possible there was a uh, that going on there but he in no way seems to be um 
Baylor this is seemed to be linked in with the Prince of the Promised, which is very close to Azora High, which is obviously very much a sort of a, a fire and law kind of thing. And that is very much not what the Faith of the Seven is about. The Faith of the Seven, as far as we can tell, doesn't really have any great history with the Long Night or any stories about how the others could be defeated, legends of that, um, anything of that ilk. So no, is the short answer. It, it, I don't think he was because it seems to be against the character of what he was about. I, I think we haven't come across him in Fire and Blood because he's he will be in Fire and Blood Part Two if we ever get that. Um, it, it appears that he was just what he appeared to be a zealot for the faith of the seven. Uh, Diego uh, Godoy um, uh, saying, "Hola, Robert. If the seasons have been out of balance for a long time, do you think this means that the others have actually been alive or around for this entire time?" In other words, if they had been fully eliminated in the first long night, wouldn't the season have come back? Seasons have come back to normal. Not necessarily. We don't know how the magic worked. Um, I think, I think the others have been around for all that time. But the the line that we can come back to on this, I think, is, um, and I wish I could quote it exactly, uh, but the the blurb on the back of the first edition of the first book, which is what George R. R. Martin will have cleared, um, says, uh, long ago in a time long forgotten, um, a preternatural event set the seasons out of balance, or a preternatural magical event set the seasons out of balance. So that is what we've got, is an event set the seasons out of balance and they've been out of balance ever since. Now, George R. R. Martin tells us not to get too sciencey about this, so I try not to get too sciencey about it in my understanding. But uh, in terms of how it seems to operate is that one, the, the planetos is still going around the sun uh, at the same rate. So the orbit is the same. Uh, but whereas um, for Earth, for example, then it sort of like wobbles around a little bit naturally. So you get summer and winter with the sunlight hitting it for longer periods or shorter periods and all the rest of it. Um, that for our planet, and it would appear for Canisos used to be the case, um, that was natural and uh, appeared you could um uh, this sort of um predict when it was going to be and you could be reasonably certain you know that certain periods of the year this was going to be such, such and such and all the rest of it what happened with this preternatural magical event was that this changed the wobble so you can no longer predict when the planet is going to be tilted in which direction sometimes it'd be tilted one way for a very long time and then it was sort of like go the other way and all the rest of it so that seems to be technically what's happening uh, they are proper seasons across the entire planet um and so you just have you know your the planet happens to be tilted this way for a while which means you get a summer lasting for nine revolutions of the sun that seems to be the way it works so the event which made that happen seems to have been a big one-off. Um, now, the the fact that the others um, are still around does not... I think that their existence is not the thing that's keeping it going. I think it is the magical event that was led to their creation has to be undone in order for that magic to be undone. That's sounds like quite a techy magical nuance point but i think that's uh, what's going to be going but the others i think you're right the implication is the others have been around all that time they've just been sort of off up in the um, lands of always winter harry but harmless 12 great name uh thank you so much for the super chat i don't see a question attached to that one um if there is then uh, please drop it in the chat and hopefully one of my um uh, moderators will pick up on it. Emily Broderick, uh, thank you, saying, are there any characters you would like to see drink shade or eat weirwood paste that haven't yet in the books? <sighs> I'd love to see Tyrion um, uh, because he would think about it in a way and analyse it in a way that 
the other characters don't so much. Danny just sort of takes the shade of the evening and kind of like accepts, oh, okay, that's it. I've had some visions and that's that's what happens. Um, Bran is still quite young and he's just been given weirwood paste. So and you know, he doesn't seem to question it that much. Tyrion's mind seems to question absolutely everything and ask about how does this work, what's happening, and I think that I would like to see him take that simply because he would try and understand what on earth was going on, as well as almost certainly getting some fantastic visions out of it as well. So I think he would be the character I would most like um, uh, to, to see have uh, some of those things. Um, is there anyone else um, off the top of my head? Uh, I think it's quite amusing when quite staid, boring characters get um, that kind of thing happen to them. So maybe, maybe someone like Sir Barristan would be quite amusing. Um, but I don't think that will happen. Um, uh, Clark and Tacos, thank you for picking up on the question from Harry, but harmless, saying, "Hi, Robert. If we see Stannis winning the upcoming upcoming battle, what might be his next step?" On to King's Landing. Thanks. Um, question mark. Well, first of all, I think there's two battles at least coming up. Um, the first battle, so Stannis is encamped a few days march away from Winterfell, and he's got uh, the Freys and the Mandalays coming at him. Now, there will be a battle there. The Mandalays. And the phrase, uh, they, they, the Mandalays want to kill the phrase. The phrase want to kill the Mandalays. Whether this turns out into an actual proper battle or not, we don't know. But there will be some sort of battle going on there. Stannis's troops almost certainly will be involved. Then, so that's the first one that there's going to be. Also, Ramsay has come out with uh, emerged from uh, Winterfell with his hounds that uh, hunt humans and wolves, uh, intriguingly. So I think that's also going to happen. Then after that, assuming Stannis survives that, then we have to get the attack on Winterfell because unless something happens to get rid of the winter, he is going to, and his army is going to freeze to death in a matter of another few days or weeks. He has to get inside Winterfell. So if he... Uh, if he survives that, what's his next move? Well, he seems to have bought in now to this idea that in order to rule the Seven Kingdoms, he has to save the Seven Kingdoms first from the others. So I think that his step, uh, in his mind, it's claim Winterfell, get uh, a Stark to be the Stark in Winterfell, if he couldn't... He, He's twice, twice tried to persuade John to do it. Um, if Rickon appears, he could put him on the throne. He wants somebody there that he can trust and knows will be on his side so that he can unite the North. Uh, and then he's also sent for an army. He's, he's borrowed money from the Iron Bank to get an army that will come over from Essos. And he will then be looking to how do we defend the North against the others. So he will look North first before looking South. But uh, I don't think he's going to survive um, that uh, that much. Morgan R. R. Hayes, uh, thank you so much for the super sticker. I do appreciate that. Um, question. Uh, just have a quick flick through, see if there's anything in the... Um, the chat, um, uh, no, let's go for, um, uh, Evan Hayes did the saying, did the GOT TV show get the design for the last half wrong? Is it more Viking like, um, yes, I'm trying to remember back in my traveler's guide. I did one to the last half. I, I think it is not. Um, uh, yeah, it wasn't like that. What they showed um, on the TV show was basically just this small little homestead, um, which sounds nice, the last half, but no, this is a proper castle. Um, so uh, that's, they, they did get the design wrong, but I kind of understood it because it's not, it wasn't important. They were just wanting to show it was a place that they could destroy. 
Uh, Amy Thomas, thank you so much, saying, what are some of your favourite ambiguous things, uh, i.e. things that are better unknown for the effect of storytelling? Um, hmm. Intriguing question. Um, ambiguous things within the story. Um, I, I love Tyrion's uh, parentage issue. Um, I, it's I've said before. It's the question that I oscillate on the most: whether Tyrion is a secret Targaryen or not. That there are clues. Um, both ways and there would be ironies both ways uh, and i i think that the ambiguity there this is another thing from a question earlier that we can add to the list of things i think we're never going to actually find out um but i love the ambiguity of it because it allows us to read in the possibility of something uh, it, into the story through his character and the potential of who he is but does not realize um that adds allows us to add an additional layer on uh, to that um other ambiguous things that i like um, um <laughs> I, I do like the one thing that works really well <laughs> is the fact that we we don't have because we don't have a, a, a sort of an omnipotent um storyteller here we just see things from people's points of view it allows people to tell tall stories that we almost believe but then don't necessarily believe for example euron storytelling did he go to old valeria it seems incredibly far-fetched that he went to old valeria but he does have a whole load of things that might come from there, like the Hellhorn, like the uh, Valyrian steel armour that we saw in the pre-release chapter from the Winds of Winter, that make you go, ah, oh, well, may maybe he did. And if anyone's crazy enough to go there, then it it, it is him. So I, I love the fact that we can have some sort of ambiguity about quite how crazy he is or what he might have actually done. And there's a lot of that that... Um, we can have ambiguity through because of the fact that this operates from a, a POV uh, approach. Classic example, probably, um, last example on this, um, Fagon. It is ambiguous. It's. I think we can pick together the clues, and I think it is reasonably clear that this is actually a Blackfire descendant and not actually Aegon the Sixth, but. George R. R. Martin has allowed the ambiguity into there, and therefore he's he's made it that the characters can believe that. Absolutely, they can believe that to be true because they haven't had all of the bits of information that we've had dotted across various POV uh, characters' um, knowledge and understanding of things and all the rest of it. So that the ambiguity behind who he is is... I find fantastic because it makes us ask ourselves the question as a reader, does it matter? If, as appears to be the case, he has been trained from his youth to be a great leader, to be a caring human being, to be somebody who thinks about the small folk, who understands the subtleties and nuances of how to run um, uh, the Seven Kingdoms, if he has all of those things, surely that means that he would actually be a good ruler? Does it matter whether he's actually who he says he is? Does it matter? Maybe he believes he, he is who he says he is, but other people know that he's not. Does that matter? This is the kind of thing where we George R. Martin has written the ambiguity in there to allow us to ask those extra questions of not just the meta questions, not just of is he this, but does it matter if, if he's that? Right. Um, good question, Amy. Thank you. Um, Diego Godoy, thank you so much, saying, hola, Robert, hola. If the seasons have been out of balance... No, I did this one. Um, sorry, uh, let's move on to the next one. So Eric Fogg saying, does the Mad Mouse kidnap Sansa, blowing her cover? Okay, so the Mad Mouse is um, a 
character, quite an, I would say, obscure character. I don't think he shouldn't be obscure, but uh, he's the character that quite a lot of people haven't picked up on. He was part of Stannis's army, but then um, he was forced to um, basically ransom himself, which would have then just completely bankrupt himself, and uh, he has been forced to become a hedge knight. So he was this, uh, I mean, he was a proper knight, um, a titled knight, and now he's just a hedge knight. And he seems understandably a little bit bitter by this turn of events. And we see him um, when he's uh, with Brienne, I think it is, first of all. And she's there, she's hunting for Sansa, and he sort of mentions that he's heard that Varys was, had offered a bag of gold for information about Sansa. And Brienne tries rather unconvincingly to sort of like put him off of the scent and say, you know, I'm not really looking for her, da 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 da, da. Um, But then he, he sort of disappears from the action for a little while, but then reappears in the Vale. And he reappears um, for this tourney that is, this is Sansa's idea, to create effectively a king's guard for the Lord of the Vale. And um, he's come not to take part in the tourney, um, but he's just come along, it would appear, he's not made it absolutely clear, but he wants to be there for the dances. He has a dance with Sansa. Um, and uh, we start to get a little bit suspicious because, again, he talks about uh, a bag of gold in connection with Sansa. And Sansa is obviously undercover, but he seems to be sort of circling in on her. So the has he followed the clues? Has he figured out that this is where Sansa is hiding? Has he decided that this is something that he might, some way that he might uh, make some money out of all of this? Um, possibly, in fact, very probably. Now, the question is, will he kidnap Sansa blowing her cover? I think that there's a, a fair chance he may blow her cover. I don't think he's going to get away with it. I don't think that he will be able to kidnap her and take her down to King's Land. I don't think that's where her story is going. But I do think that perhaps um, he may um, suddenly get this idea that that's where he will go. There's a lot of plot, I should probably say, just as a sort of a... Um, we don't often think about the Veil plot because it's just Sansa and we think, oh, she's just hanging around there until she goes up to the north, which is probably true. But there's a lot of plot to get through, as well as the Mad Mouse. We've got Littlefinger's got some huge grain storage scam going on. Um, we've got this tourney, um, which is happening. We've got the potential marriage to Harry Harding between uh, Sansa and him. Um, we've got the Veil lords who were... Um, all sort of plotting and conspiring against Littlefinger. We've got a lot of things going on, so there's a lot of plot that has to happen there. This, I think, is going to remain quite a small, this thing with the Mad Mouse is going to remain quite a small part. I do not think that he is going to manage to kidnap her, but I think that he will attempt to, and I think that that will push events on, and that will probably allow Littlefinger, because at some point he has to reveal who Sansa is, um, because that's... The, the point at that he will want to then go and try and claim the north through her as well. Um, uh, question uh, from uh, Michelle saying, Hi, Robert, new patron here. Welcome uh, to uh, in the Geek Patreon. Um, I should oh, I always do this uh, at some point patrons thank you so much um this is how you can support me best to do this if you would like to support this channel um allowing freeing me up to have the time to to make videos and do things like this uh 
joining my Patreon is the best way to do it. Uh, it's also a way to get access to extra stuff that I do. So if you want access to all of my audio um, that I produce for In Deep Geek, if you want uh, the, I did some audio narrations of the pre-release chapters of The Winds of Winter, they're there and accessible for patrons. Um, and there are also various other patron benefits like um, at $10 you get your thank you down in the description um, and also a chance every now and then to uh, influence vote on what I'm going to be making videos on in the future. I haven't done that for a little while so I shall get around to doing that again quite soon I think um, uh, perhaps what video series I do in the new year. So if you are interested at all in that then um, the best uh, thing to do is I would say there's a link down in the description. I don't think I've put the description in yet but it is in deep geek at um, so it is uh, patreon.com slash indeepgeek. Um, and if you're watching back later, there will be a link in the description. Thank you. Um, anyway, so Michelle saying, uh, new patron, always love the Baratheon line and want to know where you think our guy Gendry will end up. We know his story was mixed with Edric on the show, and I can't see things going that way. Do you think he'd accept lordship if offered? or remain with the small folk? And how do you see a reunion going down between him and Arya? So, yes, on the show, they um, merged the uh, the two stories of two of Robert Baratheon's uh, bastard children, being Gendry and this guy called Edric Storm. Edric Storm uh, was based down in the Stormlands at Storm's End. Um, now, Gendry is the older, just for clarity's sake, out of the two of them. So if you were going to legitimise Robert Baratheon's bastards, then he would be the, the one in line. Um, when I was thinking about this, I actually did a little bit of a search, and I, f I found a wormhole I wasn't expecting with links between him and Arya because I think in my mind I'd thought oh yeah that's that was just a show only thing that they got them together um, albeit briefly but actually there's I mean I wouldn't say there's a lot of foreshadowing but there's a lot of times when you go ha ah, that's interesting um, phraseology from George R. R. Martin right at the very beginning in Arya's first POV chapter then we get told that she has blacksmith's hands uh, which is quite an interesting turn of phrase. Um, later on, we get Jamie when he's discussing Arya, who says in a sort of almost a throwaway remark, he says something along the lines of, for her sake, I hope that she's forgotten that she's a Stark and has married some burly blacksmith somewhere. Um, which, when you think about it, forgetting you're a Stark is the exactly what the, the faceless men are doing well exactly but that's the the feel of you're not a stark you are no one um and marry a burly blacksmith that's again that's quite close to home with gendry so it's possible and you see the interactions between the two although she is very much a child there is definitely some um connection between the two of them there's a lot, lot of for want of a better word banter uh, between them that would mean that when they do meet up again in a few years time um then yes they probably would um be more uh the, the connection would definitely still be there so um i wasn't expecting to go down that wormhole and i frankly don't know where it leads i didn't get a chance to have a have a proper long think about it but i thought it would you might find it interesting to uh, note that there are those references in there between Arya and Gendry. Um, would he accept a lordship? Well, I mean, I think he would probably find it hard to say no, but I think that um, th it seemed like very much a kind of a show, let's tie a tie everything up, make everything uh, finish neatly, everywhere has to have a, a new lord, all the rest of it, that that seemed, you know, our heroes have to have happy endings, or some of them do, that seemed to be 
um, where that was going. So I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think that Edric Storm is an intriguing addition to this because I don't think we've seen the last of it. He was, when I say that they mixed up him, his and Gendry's stories or, or collated them, sort of merged them, um, he was the one that Melisandre was wanting to uh, potentially um, kill. Uh, he, he was the one who was leeched by her, um, and he was set free by Davos, and Davos put him with a few... Um, Good men on a boat, uh, which went over to lease in the free cities. Now, why is that important? Well, we've got various people who probably will be passing by lease at some point. We we know that the high towers have sent uh, to to lease. They're going to try and get some sell sales from there. Danny will have to sail past lease on her way to. Um, uh, Westeros so th there are lots of opportunities also um, frankly Stannis when he's um, getting his um, um, forces from over in, in Essos um, the person he sent, he sent Justin Massey and he basically said you know if you can't get the troops in Bravos, then just go elsewhere so Justin Massey could be heading down there as well and let's not forget that um, he will know about Edric Storm. So um, there's lots of possible hooks to bring him back in. I think that there's an there's definitely a chance that um, once Storm's End has fallen to Aegon, which according to the pre-release chapters of the Winds of Winter, it has done, then maybe he sees an opportunity. Maybe he is a more ambitious one. He, after all, was brought up in a castle. He was brought up knowing his ancestry um, and uh, in a way that Gendry wasn't. He was, Gendry, Gendry was brought up as a secret, um, as a blacksmith, not part of the nobles. So if anyone's got some ambition there, it's going to be Edric, not Gendry. So um, it's entirely possible that he might see that as his route back to Westeros, which actually is his home. So, you know, why not? Um, it kind of makes sense. So I think that we shouldn't discount the possibility that it's Edric who is the one who um, makes a play for being the next Lord of Storm's End. And when you think about it, what we're going to have is a situation for Aegon, where if he has got the Stormlands, he will be wanting to install somebody in the Stormlands, somebody who is loyal. Perhaps he could give that to John Connington, but presumably he'll want John Connington to be by his side. Um, and if he looks around at where the Baratheons are, Robert Baratheons died, Stannis uh, may well soon be dead, but he is uh, also in open, he will see him as being in open rebellion. Uh, Renly is dead, and then you've got Shireen, who is also not long for this world. So if you want a Baratheon, then you would have to go really for someone like Edric. Uh, question from uh, Eric Fogg saying, what role do you see Timit, son of Timit, playing in the Vale? Now, Timit, son of Timit, is uh, he was one of those uh, Vale clan leaders, if you remember when Tyrion gathered them um, uh, way back early in the plot when he escaped with Bronn, uh, going back through the mountains of the Vale. He got them on his side, and Timit, summoned, son of Timit, um, who was another one-eyed character, incidentally, if, if we're counting them, there's lots of them in this story. Um, he followed... Tyrion and went all the way to King's Landing and Tyrion used him basically as a bit of muscle while he was there and he also then sent him out just before the Battle of the Blackwater he sent him out into the Kingswood to be trying to um, slow down any attack um, which meant that uh, when Timit, someone, son of Timit and his clan then tried to get back into King's Landing after the battle, they were refused entry because Tyrion no longer handled the king. 
And so they went back to the Vale. And then we get a passing reference to the fact that since he's returned, then they've become the the clans in uh, in the Vale have become um, more. I can't remember the exact phrase, but they they've they've been busier doing more stuff uh, and slightly more aggressive. So the question is, what role might he play? I, I think the short answer is probably not a big one, but if anyone is wishing to be exiting the um, the Vale, then they will have to get past Timmit and his clan. And we do think that probably at some point, we're going to get Sansa and, and Littlefinger and the like wanting to exit the Vale. Now, they they could um, go out through the mountains, or they could go via Gulltown and catch a boat if they're heading up to the north, catch a boat up to White Harbour. I think that perhaps the role of Timmit, Timmit is not to actually be doing anything specific, but to... Um, to make people think, uh, actually, you know what, we're not going to go through the mountains because it's starting to get a little bit wintry, and to, and we've got some mountain clans who are playing up a bit, so let's get the boat instead. What does that mean in terms of uh, Sansa being on a boat rather than travelling across the ground? Well, there's lots of ships out in the narrow sea, um, so who knows? But I think that that is basically where... Um, uh, where we're going to be uh, heading up uh, is th is that it's not that he's going to be doing any huge action, but I think that he will affect, but his presence will affect the strategic maneuvers of other people. Um, Catherine, F oh, actually, hang on. Um, just no. Say thank you for the super chat. Saying, how does Euron know the horn will work for him? The this is the Hell Horn, presumably the Dragon Binder. Well, I think he doesn't, is the short answer. But what Euron has been doing is he has been taking huge quantities of the Shade of the Evening, which, and that, that's been giving him visions of some of, of the future, of, of all kinds of stuff. And what we know from the Shade of the Evening when Danny took it is that a lot of it is very accurate. Uh, some of it is telling of futures that may not, that, that will not happen. Uh, some of it is saying stuff that's happened in the past. Some of it is showing stuff that is happening at that time in different parts of the world. Um, it's showing all sorts of different things. And Euron probably has seen something with Dragonbinder of it being blown and it being, if not successful, then perhaps it's delivering a thing that he wants. So I think that is um, where he's coming from. He has this innate belief in what he's doing. And his innate belief comes not just from him knowing the future or something like that, but from the fact that he is fundamentally just trying to create chaos at this point. If we try and think of him being as this kind of great strategic leader, then yes, there's an element of that, but that's not where he's about. He's just trying to create carnage right now. And if uh, all that happens is that this um, horn goes over to uh, Slaver's Bay and you get... Um, Victarion going over there and getting angry because it's not working, then that is also going to create chaos in and of itself. But I think the short answer is he has seen it in those visions. He has seen what has happened in some sort of, kind of warped way. Uh, and that is why he is um, uh, going forward with that plan. Um, Catherine Firsith is asking about the Horn of Winter. Who made it and did it have a different original purpose other than helping to end the first long night? Uh, thanks, and I'm enjoying my IDG mug that arrived two days ago. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, uh, again, wish I'd got my props with me to show them off, but unfortunately, I'm not that organized. But the Horn of Winter. The Horn of Winter, who made it um, and what was its original purpose? My take is that 
this is part of the um, the plans that were set in place after the um, after the first long night to um, or perhaps as a part of the first long night to act as the defence for most of Westeros against the return of the others. One part of that is obviously building the wall itself, magical defense, physical wall. Um, another part of that is um, to create the, well, there was a system where the Night's Watch were given dragon glass by the children of the forest. Another part of that I think is the creation of Winterfell. I've talked many times about what I think the role of the crypts there is. I think that the Stark, dead of being amassed as an army which can be used against the others in the future and i think that the horn of the winter the point of the horn of the winter is to be raising that army from the crypts now that then means that who made it all of these things were made to some degree with the magic of the children of the forest it won't just have been the um uh, the children of the forest. I'm sure that others were involved. People like Bran the Builder and things like that. But it will have been made partly through the children of the forest's magic, with the express purpose of doing what uh, it, it is there. It's interesting that we talk about this bringing down the wall. But the one time we have uh, a, it is a legend, but we have a story of it being blown being used it doesn't it raised giants from the earth we're told um and we're not told it brings down the wall so that seems to be what it does is it brings giants from the earth so uh, my interpretation of this that's uh talking about the the starks from the uh the winterfell crypts now um what is its purpose? Its purpose is to be there and to be blown uh, when the others are coming to rouse the Starks. Um, Mara Lee asking how I first got introduced to the Song of Ice and Fire book series and TV show. What came first, the TV show or reading the books and then watching the, the TV show? Um, uh, well, the i was given a book I, I may i know i think i've said this before but i was given the book this is a long time ago i was given book one i was given a game of thrones by a friend on a recommendation i was handed it said you should read this you'll really enjoy it and as is the way of these things i had a quick look at it and then put it on the bookshelf. Um, i have an aversion for obvious reasons to um high fantasy series that have not yet finished and I quite like to wait for them to finish and then read all the way through them um but it was there and I'd had a recommendation from somebody who I trusted and so at some point I was going to try it then the tv show happened I watched season one and I thought this is brilliant and so I read the book and I thought this is even more brilliant uh, and then I bought the rest of the books that were there uh read through them and then I got on to season two so that was my sort of history with it and what that means and i suspect there are probably a few people in in this boat um it, what it means is that some of the characters i first experienced them through the tv show some of the characters i first experienced through the books and so whereas um when i the, the characters that are in book one um they most of those i when i read the books i'm seeing those characters um when the characters who introduced book two onwards i'm often seeing the tv show and comparing them to the characters that are in my mind which is the way normally these things works is you read you have the book you read the book and then uh, you're comparing uh the characters that you see uh, on the tv show against what was in your mind so that's the the order that I've had them in. Uh, Anthony Visconti, thank you so much for the super sticker. That's uh, doing a fist bump. Uh, thank you so much. I do appreciate that. Um, um, 
Crack and Tacos, you just posted a picture of Longhead Robert in a Crack and Taco t-shirt. Uh, it's true. It's on Twitter if you're interested. Um, Bread and Barnes, I think I'm down to... Oh, no, I've still got quite a few questions from my uh, patrons to go. Bread and Barnes, I'd love to hear your thoughts on an event from the books that, in my opinion, always gets glossed over. Tyrion and co. being teleported on the Roin. I'm constantly dumbfounded at how little Tyrion et al. reacts to this phenomenon. I don't expect the incident to have any real importance to the plot moving forward, but it sticks out to me as odd that neither Tyrion, Halden, or any other mildly learned person on that boat acknowledges that magic quite clearly just took place. Okay, so this is in the books. Tyrion is on the Shy Maid. He's on this boat, uh, which is going down the River Rhoyne, and he's there with uh, young Griff, old Griff, and all of the crew. He's slowly figuring out who they actually are. Are and they um, they go through uh, this um, uh, area. Um, sorrows, I always I always forget the name of it. In through the sorrows, which is this misty. We saw it. It was on the show. Uh, it's where the stone men are, uh, and it's where there's. It was this place ages ago. There was this huge bit of water magic that happened. Now, um, what happens in the books is a really intriguing thing, which is that the the boat is going along, and they pass this bridge, a very um, noticeable bridge, and then suddenly they pass it again, at which point stone men jump out and uh, attack them. And so they, their confusion about what was going on uh, gets slightly overtaken by the need to stay alive. And yes, you're right, there's not much speculation after that or acknowledgement that something really weird happened. Now, there's, uh, uh, first of all, what did happen? My take on that is that, uh, was it magic? Well, probably, I think some people talk about uh, going back through time. I don't think it was that. I think this was simply, uh, whether it's teleporting or whether it is water magic, I think this is more likely we hear about strange currents in that place where the water magic was used to sort of shift the boat back around. Uh, it's it's not just one narrow river at that point. It's sort of hugely spread out through this city. So it's entirely possible that odd water currents were used to bring the boat back. And why was it? because that was the point at which Tyrion basically figures it out and it's there's a big and loud conversation about who these people are they and who Fagon says he is he is a Targaryen he is a Valyrian now the magic that happened centuries earlier was one that was used against the Valyrians and so this i think was what was caused this was the trigger was that ah a Valyrian is here. We're going to get him. I think that was what was going on there. Um, and so um, why is it that there's not much reflection on this afterwards? Well, probably because things happen quite quickly after that. When they get through the far side, they get to sell Horace. I think it is at which point Tyrion gets kidnapped. So we actually have less than a chapter of Tyrion time, uh, and Tyrion being the person who we're seeing this crew through um, before he's got much much more important immediate things to be thinking about so that's what it is there he does he will say i'm sure he will have been assessing this and thinking about this and all the rest of it um but yeah it's purely that there's also one more answer to this which is um slightly more technical to do with the writing uh process which is george R. R. martin has said that actually there was another chapter here there was another chapter that he's written. He has it. It's somewhere locked in a safe there in George R. R. Martin Towers. Um, and in this, this is Tyrion's Adventures in the Sorrows. And um, he's not telling us what happened there. The speculation is that he meets the Shrouded Lord, who is basically the leader of the Stone Men. And it's suddenly Tyrion gets engaged in 
a lot more sort of high fantasy, lots sort of more magical part of what's going on there. Uh, but George R. R. Martin decided not to go down that route, probably uh, at least partly because he wanted to keep Tyrion as being this kind of grounded, rational person and didn't want to put him too quickly onto the road of being all very magic-y. So that that was a writing decision that was made, and so we missed out a chunk of what actually happened there. And I think that that probably played out into the following chapters that, uh, therefore, Tyrion does not think back to it as much as he might have done because George R. R. Martin took out bits that he would otherwise have definitely been looking back on. Um, and so what is left is actually not as significant as what was originally planned. So that's the sort of slightly more prosaic writing explanation, I think, for what uh, happened there. But I think the in-story explanation is that things happened quickly after that. Uh, Shah Shah saying, hi, Robert, I'm still rereading Fire and Blood. I'm wondering about the multitude of dragons. It has often been pointed out that dragons are magical creatures, and especially their birth is to be seen as somewhat magical, requiring some kind of sacrifice, as it was with Daenerys' dragons, and seems to have been tried at Summerhall. Where were all the sacrifices for the birth of the Targaryen dragons, let alone the wild living ones? Am I just missing them, or are they only required for stone or dead eggs? Um, also what happened to the cannibal and what was up with the murder of Septon Moon um, Septon Moon as I said I'm gonna I think I'm gonna do a video on that one so I will answer that in full in a video at some point in the next couple of weeks um, I'll work my way back through these ones what do you think happened with the cannibal the cannibal was one of four dragons to survive the dance of the dragons and we don't know is the short answer, and I wish I could give you a better answer to that. We do not know. He was a, um, a we call him a wild dragon. He was on Dragonstone. He got himself a lair on Dragonstone. He was called um, the cannibal because he would eat other dragons and other dragon eggs and things like that. And he people tried to tame him and ride him but no wasn't going to happen he would just kill them and eat them and then we don't hear about him because fire and blood part one which is what we've had ends now obviously at some point in the next couple of decades or so we have what is called the last dragon dying and um by that point, obviously, there must be some understanding that the cannibal had also died. So we don't know what happened in that period. We just simply have no information. The implication is that it just died. <laughs> that's that's where we're at with it. But possibly there was something else going on there. If you buy into this theory that I quite like that the maesters were seeing the opportunity to rid the world of the dragons, then perhaps they might have tried some sort of poisoning thing. Um, that's possible. But we literally have zero evidence on it. Um, so that's where we're at on the cannibal. In terms of hatching dragons, whether they require sacrifice, fire and blood, magical things, and all the rest of it. Um, the answer is on Dragonstone, and by implication further back in Old Valyria, they just hatched, just, just naturally. They didn't have to do anything. They didn't have to perform a ceremony in order to do that. This was just like normal dragon, normal animals with having babies. This was what happened. Now, after the dragons had gone, that no longer happened. The eggs stopped hatching. Now, obviously, there's lots of lore and legends and all the rest of it that about how dragons might sort of come into being and this seemed to be what egg on the fifth egg was trying to do in in trying to hatch the dragon eggs that they had got got some pyromancers in he got some um esoteric knowledge from far afield a shy perhaps 
he seems to think that you need to do some sort of magical ceremony in order to hatch these dragon eggs because the dragons had gone because that dragony magic energy was no longer there and when i say that that's not intended to be as vague as it's supposed to be when daenerys's dragons came back came into the world suddenly there was a lot more magic in this kind of ambient magic level of magic across the world went up a notch and a whole load of people could suddenly perform more magic than they could before particularly fire magic the pyromancers noted it in king's landing they could do things they'd not been able to do for a long long time uh, when the dragons were back we hear about in Karth, we hear about a fire mage who suddenly his powers got hugely more impressive after Daenerys's dragons were born. So uh, having dragons in the world seems to add to a, the ambient amount of magic across the piece. So some magic begets more magic, in, in, in other words. So um, when there aren't the dragons, suddenly it's harder to for the dragons to hatch and they just don't uh, but what happened with Daenerys was this sort of the perfect storm of things happening George, uh, George R. R Martin has been quite clear that this was everything was exactly right for this to happen it wasn't just like an accident the, exactly the right things had to happen you had the sacrifices and these were specific and very powerful sacrifices if you think about it you had depending on which way you cut it Miri Mazdo was definitely sacrificed she was a magic user uh, Danny had sacrificed Carl Drogo who was the mighty king of the Carl of the um uh the dothraki um you also get um there was the death of rago her son or the uh the killed the stallion as well um there were significant sacrifices going on there there was fire um and there was also the comet above and there was an intentionality from danny in order to do that she that this was what she was thinking she wasn't just thinking that she was going to go and die and all the rest of it she actually actively was thinking about hatching dragon eggs um so that got it exactly right what seems to have happened is with egg uh, at summer hall was that they got the idea right of some of the things that were needed but it, they just hadn't quite got it right mate something went badly wrong obviously but they'd uh, not all of the things were in position in the same way that they uh, they were when danny was hatching her eggs so short answer to that one while the dragons were around then they just hatched normally without lots of fuss when the dragons had gone then you needed to get the exact right bit of sort of sacrifice and magic and all the rest of it uh let's have a quick uh, check through the chat um uh the disputed lands is here hi there amanda good to see you um uh quick check through um Uh, so Disputed Land saying uh, the dragon pit seemed to have hampered growth of all the dragons later on. Yeah, it did um, definitely did uh, hamper the growth of the dragons. That doesn't, however, cover the issue about the dragons um, that came later. There was uh, there were dragons who were born later, stunted growth, not not apparently connected with the dragon pit. Um, but uh, yes, the, the dragon pit definitely didn't seem it did seem to be uh, hindering. Uh, question from Chris Selka. Uh, saying, I find it curious that Robert Baratheon's Warhammer, which is a very famous item, is just never mentioned, framed or inherited. Is there any chance it shows up, or is it just a cool but unrealistic weapon to prove Bobby B's fighting prowess and almost magical strength? Um, would love to hear your thoughts. Personally, I think Warhammers would be great against the others because it would easily shatter them into small, <laughs> manageable pieces and create good range. Um, uh, 
Uh, thanks for the content. Can't believe how great the Crips theory is, and I strongly believe in Ashara and Howland. Another believer in Ashara and Howland. We will we will convert the entire um, uh, Game of Thrones community before too long, I'm sure. Um, but Bobby B's hammer uh, on that last point in terms of smashing the others. Uh, if you look at the way that just a piece of dragon glass can do that, I think it's it's about the. Uh, what some, a weapon is made of is way more important than its size and shape in terms of taking on the others. But it, what happened to his um, Warhammer, we, we aren't told. We simply are not told. Now, it's entirely possible it was buried with him. We're not even really told about what happens with Robert Baratheon's body, to be honest. Uh, it's entirely possible it was buried with him. It's entirely possible it's just now lurking somewhere in a, uh, one of the armories of the Red Keep. It's the the um, likelihood, though, is that it wasn't sort of melted down and reused in the same way that ice, Ned Stark's sword, was. Um, it, it's entirely likely that that's not what happened with Rob. They didn't want to do a thing there because the... Joffrey and then Tommen are on the throne at the moment, claiming the right to be on the throne because they are claimed to be the children of Robert Baratheon. And so they are not wishing to undermine Robert Baratheon in any way. This is House Lannister, so they will not have done anything big and obvious to um, uh, sort of subvert the value of something which is very uh, obviously his. So uh, it's probably either buried with him or just lurking somewhere in, in some storeroom or armory somewhere. Boring, but probably true. Lady Pushkin saying, do you think there will be any major surprises in the book that are not in the show? Yeah, almost certainly. And this is one of those things where... Uh, I, if, if I guess them now, they're not going to be a surprise. But um, yes, the, the the thing about George R. R. Martin, as he said many, many times, he is a gardener writer um, rather than architect writer, which means that he, as he writes, he allows himself to go off in different directions if that is where the characters and the plot are taking him. So the reason why he was a bit vague on details with the showrunners was because he hadn't written and he'd not planned it out exactly. Yes, some he knows the end main end blocks for a lot of different things, but exactly where stuff goes, we do not know. And one thing, particularly comparing book and show that George R. R. Martin was clear on is that although he did tell the showrunners the fates of the main characters, they did not discuss the fates of the smaller characters. Um, and I think you can speculate as to who comes under that list, but it's people like Bronn, for example. I don't think that they discussed what happened with Bronn. I suspect most of what happened on the show with Bronn won't happen in the books. Uh, but that kind of level of character... I think they will have very different stories going on in the books. So yes, there will definitely be surprises. And I'm I'm really looking this the thing I'm looking forward to probably the most is the times when uh, it's not how we expect it to go, but it's just where George R. R. Martin's imagination has gone. If the books come out and they're exactly as we're expecting, then we will appreciate them and enjoy the uh, the, the majesty of what they are. But I, I also want to be surprised by some of the twists and turns, and I, I'm pretty sure I will be. Anyway, uh, Ariel Winchester saying, Hi, Robert. Could you talk about some of the significant parallels between what's going on now in the story and similarities throughout the history of a Song of Ice and Fire universe? Also, what significance do you think they play? Could there be some foreshadowing for the end game? Yes, uh, this, this is one of those things where I could I could talk for a few hours on this one. Um, so I think I'll just give a few different examples. Um, George R. R. Martin, what George R. R. Martin as a general idea, what George R. R. Martin tends to do is he doesn't have history repeating itself, but he does like it echoing. He likes to be able to say, well, that was a bit like what happened there. So. Daenerys invading from 
uh, Essos over to uh, Westeros is going to have echoes of Aegon's invasion. I think that she will probably land on Dragonstone. I think that clearly we've got Drogon has got this kind of echo from Beleriand, the Black Dread. Um, and I think that she, her having three dragons is going to be, um, a, a, or is a clear echo from across from that. So that's there. Uh, what does that tell us? Well, that probably that reminds us that dragons aren't unbeatable. I think that is one of the things that I would take from there is that do not, although they will appear for a long part, particularly of the Winds of Winter, as being this absolutely game-changing force that nothing can possibly stop them, they can die. And we've seen this again and again and again in Fire and Blood. Dragons do die. They die in a lot of different ways. Uh, they can kill each other. They can be hit by... Um, uh, I'm going to say lucky shots or well-aimed shots from the ground. Uh, there are a lot of different ways that dragons can die. So um, that, I think, is one of the things we've got there. Another thing, uh, the Night's King and the story of the Horn of Winter, I think, is going to be clearly echoed. As I was talking earlier, I think that's going to be clearly echoed where we get the Wildlings and the Night's Watch and the... Um, the, the the forces of the north led by the lord of winterfell will be facing up against the others in some way and i think that that is clearly going to be uh, echoed across into the current story based on what we've had in the past i think the use of the horn of winter will be again echoed across and then lightbringer as i say i think that that um it's it's an image that i've had well before season eight, this is the one of John killing Daenerys, and I think that that is going to be an echo of the Azora High story of, um, and may well even be as he pulls his sword out, it is a flaming sword. She is, after all, uh, Targaryen, part dragon. So uh, that's entirely possible. Now, question from um, uh, Dan McKay. Roos Bolton isn't quite normal, is he? I get the feeling that he knows that Ramsay will be the end of him, but he is fine with that. I would like to know more about Roos's motivation in legitimising Ramsay, despite the danger of doing so. I would like to know why Roos is so creepy. I suspect that George R. R. Martin has already given us all the info on that that we need. Um, so, uh, the in terms of if you want... The, an explanation for why he's creepy. I don't endorse this, but I think it's an excellent and fun video. Do check out Bolt On um, by Alt Shift X. Uh, just search it, and it's uh, is very entertaining. Um, in terms of Roos Bolton, um, he is creepy, and he's deliberately. Um, and we don't we don't get this so much. I think from the show but it's mentioned in the books quite a lot he is deliberately normal and average and quiet and not demonstrative and all the rest of it his he's described as being of you know, average height not particularly uh good looking or ugly he's um he's his overall th sort of theory of how to govern is to have um, uh, a peaceful land and a, and a content people or something like that, which doesn't sound like what we think of as Rhys Bolton, but he's just basically keep it nice and low key and all the rest of it. Um, he challenges Ramsay about the fact that people fear Ramsay and, and uh, he says, you know, you don't, you won't find people uh, telling lots of stories about me. Um, they do tell stories about him, of course, but that's certainly how he sees himself as just being this steady as you go kind of leader. Um, yes, he's ruthless and clever and all the rest of it, but that's the image that he's trying to be putting across and how he self-identifies. The question about Ramsay is an intriguing one. So he did he did have a natural son. He did have a son by his first marriage. Ramsay probably killed that son. Now, 
why would he then legitimize Ramsey? He knows what Ramsey's like. He clearly doesn't always approve of what Ramsey's about. Um, in fact, he rarely seems to approve of what Ramsey is about. But um, he legitimizes him nonetheless. Why? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. Uh, firstly, there's a um, keeping your potential enemies close is a good strategic move sometimes. But also he wanted, uh, in order to solidify his hold on Winterfell, he wanted to make sure that uh, he could marry his heir to what he a Stark or somebody he pretended was a Stark, and that would not work if Ramsay Bolton was uh, Ramsay Snow still. He had to have him legitimised. So he legitimises him first, then he marries him to Jane Poole, who he is telling everyone is Arya. Ah, yeah. So that is the, there's a pure pragmatic reason for that. Um, does he um, think that Ramsay's going to be his downfall? Well, I don't personally think so. I suspect that what he's thinking is he's going to have uh, more children of, of his own, um, and he's hoping that Ramsay will get a child with um, uh, Jane Poole, and that's the point one would have thought that perhaps he can start thinking about getting rid of Ramsay because Ramsay will have served his purpose. I, I don't think that he's as, um, as stupid as, as perhaps... Uh, you might think he is, but he's um, his motivations for legitimizing. It's a high risk strategy, but the, his whole uh, plan has been high risk. Trying to topple the Starks is high risk. He has to go down a few of these uh, things that could go very right or very wrong. Um, Maester Mansa. Uh, actually, is that uh, this is my last question for my patrons. So if you've got any more questions in the chat, uh, this is a good time to uh, drop them in there. I will try and pick up as many as I go um, after that. Um, Maester Mansa saying, uh, Hi, Robert. I enjoyed your video about the seasons being out of balance, but it led me to a strange thought. Are there others also responsible for the abnormally long summers? I always assumed that they just sort of brought a magical coldness with them or were somehow responsible for this coldness being spread over the land, similar to how Sauron needed to send dark clouds over Middle Earth to protect his minions that were weakened by sunlight. The planet still orbits the sun in the same way, but they make vast areas abnormally cold through magic and possibly some sort of cloud cover. Um, so then uh, is Westeros naturally a lot hotter than we see or just cooled by magic at times? Okay, so th this is how I see it. I tried to sort of explain about the wobbly orbit a little bit earlier. Uh, and again, I say the thing that George R. Martin says every single time this comes up, this isn't science that is doing this. There's no scientific answer. This is magic. So uh, we have to accept that this is a magical answer to what is going on with the seasons. So the others bring winter as it were yes they do we see this happen and this is specifically in the prologue and this is a fascinating little bit of writing because we're our attention is drawn to the um this is prologue to book one uh, our attention is drawn to the seasons quite a few times early on the fact that it's been long um uh, winters now or sorry l a long summer now what happens is, and they, this was changed for a little bit for the um, TV show, so we often miss a little bit of the nuance of what happened here. But when they discover this, uh, the the dead wildlings, which is what they're looking for, they discover these dead wildlings, and then uh, Will reports back, and he says uh, they're all dead they're lying there uh, and then Waymar Royce just sort of says what well, is there any blood and he says no there's no blood it's like they froze to death effectively and he said well they can't have frozen to death because um it's not winter and they have this long discussion and Will just basically said I know what I saw and so then they go back and the bodies have all gone obviously they've been raised as once but the the implication of this 
because then the cold starts arriving. Then uh, that's when the others appear on the scene. The implication is that these people did, the wildlings did freeze to death. They froze to death in their sleep because the others came. And that's how the others killed them. Simply by being close by, they all froze to death. The others didn't have to stab them or do anything like that. That was, they just killed them with the cold. So that the others bring the cold and they do bring in in some sense the winter but um it's uh they don't the stump the the majority of the time they keep themselves or uh, before the story we get they kept themselves way up in the the frozen north and it hasn't actually affected anything so the seas the sun the seasons as we know them with this kind of like sometimes they're a short time sometimes they're a long time that is unaffected it would appear by the movements of the others um it's not that where the others go it's winter when they go go somewhere else and it, it becomes summer again that's not the way that it works on planetos uh, but they add this extra layer of when they are there then they it's always going to be winter that's the the way that one works uh, Antoine Dennison, thank you very much. Uh, saying any thoughts on the fate of Victorian Greyjoy? Yep, um, he's not long for this world, uh, is my main thought. He will try and capture a dragon, he will probably survive until Daenerys gets back. She will be told that he tried to capture one of her dragons, and may even have succeeded, uh, in but it went to Euron. And um, she is not going to take kindly to somebody trying to steal her dragon. So um, he will be killed. And he may well even be the person who is uh, who she saw in one of the visions in the House of the Undying. Somebody strapped to the front of a boat uh, with grey lips. Uh, that might be him she saw. So, yeah, he's going to die. Um for the crime of trying to take Danny's dragons. <laughs> Carl Karsnark saying, so they're trying to get Jane Poole into the gene pool. That's exactly right. That's what they were trying to do. Um, question. Um, so my name says, to take Ramsay in and foster him after suspecting he has killed his son is insane, even considering whacking the stocks. It... It, it is, but I think it also goes to show the mentality of Roos Bolton. We learn a lot about him. He's very self-confident. Um, uh, he's very self-confident. Um, having a quick flick through. Um, Antoine Dennison uh, saying, the seasonal fluctuation can be easily explained by the interference of another planetary orbit which aligns with Planetos or blocks the sun. Uh, it could, but George R. R. Martin specifically says, do not look for these scientific answers. It is not one of these scientific It is not about... And he, he says, he sort of says... Now, people always come to me and say, this can be explained by the fact that there is a dwarf star here and there's a, such a... And, and he says, no, it's fantasy. It's magic. Um, so, uh, yes, all of these scientific explanations may well work, but he is very clear that, it, that this is not what's happening uh, in this story. Um, okay, guys, I think uh, with that, I will just start pointing at things, as I often do towards uh, the end of these live streams. If you are interested in watching more of these uh, live streams, then there will be appearing a link somewhere around here if you're watching a little bit later. Uh, if you'd like to either support this channel or get access to some of the uh, things that I do just for my patrons, there will be a link appearing somewhere around here. Okay, I will be back same time next week. I will uh, announce the topic in advance for that one, I think, uh, rather than doing just another open Q&A. Take care, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving if you are in America and you are celebrating it, and I will see you again next week.